Bristow by Frank Dickens, with Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, and Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy. Fair shares. You know my trouble? I'm unlucky. I was born with rubbish genes. Not exactly rubbish genes, but the wrong genes. I inherited the genes on my father's side. Genes not of this century. I would have probably made a name for myself if they were still laying siege to castles. Because my great-great-great-grandfather was one of those soldiers that attached stones or boiling cauldrons to giant catapults. He was eventually, according to family records, hoist by his own petard. But that's another story. Since I work as a buying clerk in a big organisation, it would have helped me more had I been born with my mother's genes, because her side of the family were in business. Merchants handling spices and perfumes and silks from faraway places with strange-sounding names. Not that my mother's ancestors were traders themselves. According to the family records, they were domestics in the Marco Polo family, but there is no doubt they would have been familiar with stocks and shares. Knowledge picked up in the conversation over dinner as they were serving the guests their exotic meals. And it is this knowledge that would have been handed down to me in her genes. I could have done with some of them and that know-how about a fortnight ago, when what started out as a typical day... Morning, Mr. Stationmaster. Uh, no sign of the 8.15 commuter special, although it clearly says 8.15 on your timetable. Is there a reason for this, or is it some game? where the train that gets closest to this time wins a prize. <laughs> Sir, you are a wag. But if you see anything even resembling a train, please give me a nod. It's so long since I've seen one, I've forgotten what they look like. And now, if you'll excuse me... I got in early. I could tell the cleaning ladies had been hard at work. My seat was still warm and a lot of my paperwork had been corrected. What on earth is Mr Bristow flailing his arms about for? Desk rage? In a way. He's going through his drowning man routine. He claims every time he sits down at his desk, his whole past life flashes before him. Mr Bristow! Heaven's alive, boy. You startled me. Postcard from the cleaning lady. Shall I read it out? Why not? Lovely weather. Beautiful sunny morning. Stayed in, dusted the room, swept the floor, washed the linoleum, scrubbed the bath, disinfected the toilet... Having a lovely time. Bears out what I've always said. A change is as good as a rest. What a life. As we left the office on Friday, it started to rain, and it rained right through the weekend and all the way here this morning. Then, as we came into the building, the rain stopped. And look at it out there now. Nine to five sunshine. Jones, why do we stick at this job? Oh, wages. That's why we stick at this job, because they pay us wages. But there's more to life than this. There's a world out there waiting to be conquered. It don't beat wages. You can't beat wages. I want of excitement, ambition and adventure. Oh, wages is all them things and much, much, much more. Oh. Morning, Mr. Flood. Morning, Flood. Morning, sir. Ignorant pig. Friday lunchtime, he passed me in the street, didn't say a word. I said, good afternoon. He ignored me completely. I'd have run after him and given him a piece of my mind if I'd been foraging through a dustbin at the time. Good morning, all. Isn't it exciting? Good morning, Miss Sutman. I know something is exciting because the girls in the typing pool have all polished the rings on the ends of their noses. <laughs> but I'm not acquainted with the reason. Sir Reginald Chester Perry, the firm's founder, is in the building. Exciting, Miss Sutman? Why should it be exciting because our beloved firm's founder has come in to play with his toys? It may not be exciting to you, but the girls in the typing pool have never seen him in the flesh. Have you? No. Jones has, haven't you, Jones? Haven't I what? Seen Sir Reginald Chester Perry. Yes. Bumped into him in the corridor. Sent him flying. How did he take it? Picture, if you can, two clear blue eyes filled with compassion and understanding. Hold on, Jones. Do you consider yourself some sort of authority on people's expressions? As a matter of fact, I do. How would you describe this expression? 
That is a mixture of loathing and contempt. He's very good. <laughs> yep, but enough of this. The question we must ask ourselves is this. Why has Sir Reginald Chester Perry, our beloved firm's founder, chosen this particular day to grace us with his presence? Oh, look at his car out there. That beautiful white rolls with the black leather upholstery. When are you going to get one of those? Payday. But he's silly to come into town in a car with traffic warden 262 on the rampage. <laughs> he's always getting parking tickets. Look at the number of tickets she's handed out this morning. There's a car in the street. Practically a rainforest out there. Surely a parking ticket is nothing to a multi-millionaire. And that's where you're wrong, Miss Sully. People with money are reputedly mean. And none more so than our beloved firm's founder, who bought his helicopter simply to scour the countryside in the mornings and looking for latecomers. The question we are asking, Miss Sunman, is why our beloved firm's founder should suddenly deign to call on us. And we shall have the answer in any second. <laughs> Here comes the lift boy. I say... Hello, Mr. B. What can I do for you? Why is original Chester Perry here? What's in it for me? Don't waste time, boy. Jones, give him a quick Chinese burn. No need for that. The directors are in. I took a crowd up to the boardroom. It's an emergency meeting. The Chester Perry Company are making a takeover bid for Miles and Rudge, the firm across the street. It was at that moment that a shudder went through me. It might have been that I caught my elbow on the edge of the filing cabinet, but I'd rather believe it was one of my mother's ancestors' genes pricking its ears up at the mention of the word takeover, springing into action like one of my great-great-great-grandfather's forebears sighting a castle wall. I took over the situation. Thank you, lad. <coughs> on your way. Take it easy, will you? Miss Sullivan, the conversation you just heard is confidential. You mean about the takeover? Shh. Walls have ears. Careless talk costs lives. Joe! Sorry. Why has it got to be kept secret? If news of this leaked out, it would cause a sensation on the stock exchange. Stocks and shares, etc., etc. Panic buying and so on. Confusion, chaos, bulls and bears. Dow Jones index down, FTSE up, Hang Seng uh, something, something. Jones, I shan't tell you again. You are now frightened, Miss Sunderland. I, I wouldn't say frightened. I don't know what you're talking about, that's all. Uh, quite so, men's talk. <laughs> you run along, my dear. But remember, mum's the word. Bye. I've been thinking, Jones. If we knew anything about the stock market, we ought to be able to make some money out of this. I mean, we know that our company are going to try and take over another company, and uh, we know this. And if we bought shares in that company, or this company, we could tell a broker this, uh, and he could invest and gain heavily. You are talking about... Um, no, no, what, what, what is it? We have, we have information. We ought to invest in the, um, in the company, yeah. in the company that is taking over... No... The company that is being taken, or is it the company that's, which is us, of course, the the buyer, the broker buys the shares mm. and and sells them to us, and we buy them, and mm. and everyone makes a killing. That, that that's what we're talking about, right? It's brilliant, Jones. We are sitting on a fortune, but we must keep it to ourselves and not go around telling everyone. I know you and your loose tongue. Now, how do we go about getting some advice? <laughs> Of course. The answer to our prayers. I'll say nothing like a nice cup of tea and a chocolate bun to start the day. Jones, I'm not talking about tea and buns. I am referring to what we were talking about. The stocks and shares thing. Uh, look at the cream puffs. Stocks and shares? You want to know about investment? You want to put a folio together? You have a good tip? You want a broker? Don't keep touching them, Jones, unless you're going to buy. You're spreading germs all over the place. I don't know where you were brought up. But they must have told you about hygiene. I'll have the eclair, the macaroon, the custard tart and the donut. Steady, Jones. Don't go spending it before you've earned it. And don't tell me what to do with my money. Gentlemen, please behave yourselves. Well... I'm afraid you can't take all those, Mr Jones. Otherwise, there won't be any left for anyone else. It's not my fault. She put more cakes on the trolley. There's no room. Nonsense. Assuming the surface area of a macaroon is three and a quarter centimetres... Hello? What's this in your waste paper basket, Mr. Bristow? Why, it's just as light as a feather fairy cake. Uh, it must have fallen off your desk. Fallen off nothing. It was pushed. Jones, we have to talk. Thank you, Mrs. Buddy. Bye. Oh, oh. Did you get anything from what she said? Not really. Yeah, I didn't think you did. But I wish you would pay more attention. Mm -hmm. If we're going to make a killing out of this, we have to listen and absorb everything that we are told. Right. 
Some people have to go to evening classes and all that to learn what we can learn in a few hours. I mean, we are at the centre of the operation. It is all happening around us. It was good in a way that we didn't show too much interest in what Mrs. Purdy was saying right. and alert anyone who was listening as to our intentions, uh -huh. because it's essential we keep it to ourselves. Yeah. We don't want too many people catching in. We need someone who knows all and says an out. Got it. The man we need is Fred Stokes. Fred Stokes, the caretaker? He mixes, he gets around, he listens, he keeps himself to himself. Do you know where he hangs out? Follow me. Are you sure he lives down here? Oh, yeah, I've been here loads of times. <laughs> Rather creepy. Reminds me of Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> or the third man. Your Judd, the hired hand in Oklahoma. Yeah. Oh, Judd, Judd is dead. A candle lights his, his head. Oh. Oh, here we are. Door on the right. <laughs> Who is it? It's me, Jones, from the buying department. How many of you are there? Just me and a friend. His name is Bristow. Come in, both of you, and warm yourself. Oh. Thanks, Stokesy. Now oh. then. Oh. Now, what can I do for you? I take it you haven't come all this way just to look at the scenery? No, as a matter of fact... <laughs> Mind where you are putting your feet. Sorry. Your friend's a bit clumsy, isn't he? I'm afraid so. I'd better do the talking. We want to know something about... Stocks and shares. And we want to know quickly. And we have to... What's the matter with a man? I told you to be careful. Mm. Figure I ain't used to all this being trodden on. Sorry, sorry. If he's clumsy like that down here, what's he like up there? Those poor girls in the typing pool must go around in fear of their lives. He can't help it. He's naturally clumsy. For heaven's sake, keep still, Bristow. Mm. We want to know something about... Stocks and shares. Stocks and shares, eh? Uh, about making money out of a takeover deal. Takeover deal, eh? So? Well, if you'd asked me about rats, mice and associated rodents, I could have given you the lot. Door and window frames is no one better. Radiators and general fixings, no problem. But stocks and shares and takeovers, silch. Stocks and shares is my Achilles heel, I'm afraid. You mean we've come all this way, but... <coughs> Get him out of here! He'll kill us all! <laughs> Fine waste of time that turned out to be. All that splashing about. Oh, don't look at me like that. At least I tried. And I got wet as well. Answer that. Bristow of buying. Can I help you? I can't see how you were affected. What do you mean? It looks bad. Just a minute. Jones, pull the socks in. The people in the office across the road are complaining. Oh, right oh. Sorry about that, but we don't have the radiators on in the spring. Jones, we must be stupid. We have overlooked the one person capable of putting us wise in this matter. Who's that? Is the postboy there, please? Gone to lunch. When he gets back, ask him to pop up to the buying department. The answer to all our problems. That afternoon, Miss Peach put her head round the door. I was delightfully surprised. She looks much better if you can't see her body. Mr Bristow? Hmm? What's the latest on the takeover bid? Don't tell me you know about it. It's all over the typing pool. Everyone knows. Oh, curse that Jones. It's supposed to be confidential. How are we going to make any money out of it if everyone knows? Make money? I'm not at liberty to discuss it. It's to do with buying shares, isn't it? Who told you that? The cleaning lady. Mrs Crisp knows. That means everyone in the firm knows. They'll be shouting it from the rooftops next time. Post from? Is your postboy there? It's Bristow of the buying department. Bristow. B-R-I-S-T-O-W. B for Birmingham, R for Roehampton, I for Inverness. That, that's right. Bristow. I need him up here urgently. Where does he go for lunch? The Casa Pastrami in the High Street. Thank you. 
<laughs> These modern kids live the life of O'Reilly. Thirty minutes for lunch? Disgraceful. When I started here, the post boys were quite happy with five minutes and a bowl of gruel. Why do you need him urgently? Because he has the contacts we need. He has contacts in the city, top people, influential people, brokers and so on. How does a postboy get to know those kind of people? He goes scrumping in the stockbroker belt, doesn't he? Speaker to English. Welcome to Cardza Pastrami. <coughs> Does the postboy from Chester Perry's come here for lunch? Oh, can you describe him? Certainly. Face like an aubergine, hair like spaghetti, and eyes like black olive. Oh, he's been and gone. Mm. Are you from Chester Perry's? Doesn't it show? The hollow cheeks, the sunken eyes. My sister is a tea lady there. Mrs. Purdy. Do you know her? Who doesn't? Heart of gold top. It was her presented us with all our crockery. Oh, of course. All Mark CP. CP, Chester Perry. Casa Pastrami. <laughs> Very clever. Well, I can't stop. Ciao, ciao, bambini. Oh, still here, Miss Peach. Any sign of the postboy? He hasn't been here while I've been here. Bristol! Mm, yeah. This place is like a pigsty. I want it cleaned up at once. Uh, yes, Mr. Fudge, certainly, Mr. Fudge. Right away, Mr. Fudge. Surely you don't let him talk to you like that. He's always like that when he's under pressure. And he's under pressure whenever Sir Reginald is around. You'll have to excuse me. I'll let you get on with it. Bye. <coughs> Postrom, any news of the lad? <laughs> don't forget to tell him. <coughs> what on earth are you doing? Well, this place is like a pigsty. Papers everywhere. We'd better tidy it up. Get lost. I'm fed up with being bossed around. Exactly who do you think you are? <coughs> I've no intention of tidying up. I'm not asking you to do it. I'll do it. Cleanliness is next to godliness. I'll move this chair, this one, here. Ah, well done, Bristow. Jones, give Bristow a hand, you lazy good-for-nothing. Why, you rotten... Move that filing cabinet over here. There's a good chap. Many hands, etc., etc. Oh! Jones, although I say it myself, the place looks a treat. And the floor. You could eat your breakfast off that floor. And while you're down there eating your beans on toast, would you give my shoes a quick buff? Sir Reginald might want to inspect some of his senior stuff. He won't come in here. An 18th in line for chief buyer is hardly senior stuff. Oh, you never know. He might come in here to inspect the Miles and Rudge building, and I may be able to give him a few pointers. He won't come in here. You know, your trouble, Jones, you are full of assumptions. Why do you think I've had the place tidied up? Why do you think I've had you down on your knees, polishing the floor until your shirt is soaked with perspiration and you look as though you've been dragged through a hedge backwards? Because I want Sir Reginald, our beloved founder, uh, to like what he sees as he steps through that door. <laughs> Pass me that copy of the House Journal. I wish you'd stop giving me orders. Anyone would think you run this office. You don't outrank me, you know. You might think you do, but you don't. Don't bring personality into this. I come before you alphabetically. Now pass me that house journal. Oh, get lost! Uh, Jones, wait! Oh, what a fool the man is. We are sitting on the edge of a fortune and he starts throwing tantrums. Get, Hewitt, stay where you are. Let me put some paper down. I've just cleaned the floor. So I see. Fantastic. Is it someone's birthday? Yes? Sir Reginald Chester Perry is in the building. Oh, I know. They're putting down red carpet in the corridor and painting some of the offices. What's that you're laying down? The house journal? Yeah. Well, it looks better torn up on the floor. <laughs> Especially that cover picture of Sir Reginald. Who blacked in his teeth? Oh, uh, Jones. Rather good, isn't it? <laughs> you could get into trouble for that. It's worse than defacing a coin of the realm. Have you ever seen him in the flesh? Of course. I bumped into him outside the boardroom once. Locked him down the stairs. How did he take it? Picture, if you can, two clear blue eyes filled with compassion and understanding. Oh, Jones tells it better. <laughs> Buying department, Hewitt speaking. Is he? Are you sure? Gordon Bennett, I'll tell him. 
According to Jones, Sir Reginald is coming up here. <laughs> That's me off. Bye. Holy mackerel. Holy mackerel. Holy mackerel. Good morning, Your Highness, sir, Your Worshipful Holiness. Oh, shoe, Miss Peach. Hello, Mr. Bristow. What are you doing down there? Yeah, I'm putting these papers down to keep the floor clean. Sir Reginald is paying us a visit. Oh, will you get me his autograph? Ask him to sign to Punella. Of course not. How can I possibly ask for his autograph? He thinks I'm a top man. Top men don't ask for autographs. Is that your name? Punella? Punella Peach. Uh, good morning, Your Worshipful Holiness King Majesty. Uh, shit. Oh, it's you, Jones. Careful! Don't step on the floor. Step on the papers. I will not step on the papers because I am not leaving papers all over my nice, clean floor. So Reginald is on his way. What do we do? What do we do? Calm down, Bristow. We've done everything we can. Uh, Miss Peach! We don't want him to see you. Hide out of the desk. No, 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 no. The, the broom cupboard. Quick. For heaven's sake, Bristow, take it easy. Sit down. Uh, now, let's get organised. Uh, Have you spoken to the postboy about you-know-what? Well, you-know-what? You I don't follow. The chairs. The chairs? Oh. I mean, it's all right. She knows. Everybody knows. No, he hasn't been up yet. He's still at lunch. Greedy little pig. You think a kid that size could get by on a bag of crisps? Uh, Bristow, will you snap out of it? You are waffling. We need that kid, otherwise we're losing a fortune. Bristow, answer it. No, no, get out of the way. What's that? On his way. Excellent. We're ready. He's on his way. Stand by the door, Miss Peach. All right. Which one's on his way? He's on his way. Thanks. They're both on their way. Pull yourself together, man. Action stations, Miss Peach. Sir Reginald! Sir Reginald, he's coming! I can hear him! That's not Sir Reginald. It is! I know his footsteps! It's a postboy. Careful, postboy, the floor is slipping. <laughs> my leg! My leg! Yeah, postboy, oh, now, no, listen no, carefully. Right. My leg! He's hurt his leg! Oh, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. I can't talk to the boy now. Uh, Miss Peach, Prunel, you don't seem oh. to understand. There's a lot of money at stake. My leg, my leg, I think it's broken. What the devil is going on out here? It's the post boy, sir. Oh. I can see that. What's the matter with him? It's my leg. He thinks it's broken. I see you. Oh, they can't stay here. People have got to get in and out. Put him in my office. You can't move him. Bristow, who is this young lady? Miss Peach of the Typing Hall. Oh. Miss Peach. I suggest you return to the pool from whence you came and let us handle matters which concern our own department. Edwards! My leg! What about my leg? I'm sorry, I am not moving until that child is placed under medical supervision. Well, lad, uh, about a leg, do you feel well enough to be moved? Well, I'll try. Yeah, Bristow Jones, don't just stand there. Give the boy a hand. Yeah, and you, right. Miss, okay. uh, instead of standing there with your hands on your hips, call the medical staff and tell them to send someone up here to remove the child. <laughs> Dear, oh dear, here comes another one. What do you want, Miss Sunman? Good afternoon, Mr. Fudge. I wonder if you've seen... <laughs> Why, there you are, Miss Peach. I was sent out to look for you. Miss Glockley wants to know where you are. You've been absent from your desk for 20 minutes. Ow! 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 ow Gently, Briscoe. He's not a sack of coal. Oh, Don't oh, take him to my oh, office. He's all tidy in there. Take him to the sick bay. Ow! Ow! Oh, hurt him. Put him down. <laughs> Sick me. Mr. Fudge, the boy is in pain. Mr. Jones, what are you doing? Oh, I want to get his shoes off before his feet start swelling up. Ouch, get off! You'd better leave them, Jones. The child is suffering. No, don't put him down, Bristol. Oh, we don't want him in here. Take him somewhere else. Sir Reginald's party are due to arrive any minute now. He's very heavy, sir. Jones, give Bristol a hand. I'm trying my best. Oh, no, steady, Jones. You don't know your own strength. No. You said the sick bay, sir. Uh, sick bay, was it? I don't care where you take him. Get him out of here! Oh. 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 Get him down! Give him to me! Oh. No, watch out, Miss Summon. The floor very slippery. Oh. 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 All right, Miss Summon. Oh, my leg! My leg, I think it's broken! Oh. Uh, this way, Sir Reginald. Oh, this right, is the that. buying department, which is run by Mr. Fudge. <laughs> now, uh, careful, sir. The floor is slippery. <laughs> <laughs> careful! Oh, 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 oh. It's the leg, is it, sir? <laughs> I don't want to talk about Friday. Good morning, 
Mr. Bristow. Well, well, Miss Peach, as I live and breathe. I knew it was you. I heard the tap-tapping of your walking stick coming down the corridor. How is the leg? Painful. How Sir Reginald? When you're as rich as he is, a broken leg is nothing. He's been carried round on a litter. Eh, just think, Miss Peach. Had it not been for us, he would never have broken his leg. The takeover bid would have gone through, and we'd have been on easy street. As it was, no one made any money. Except Miss Sunman. Miss Sunman? She made a lot of money. I don't follow. How could Miss Sunman have made money? She heard Sir Reginald was getting lots of parking tickets. And being mean, like all rich people, he didn't like it. Because of the number of tickets he was getting every time he came to town, he decided to buy the building opposite, pull it down and turn it into a car park. Miss Summan realised this and invested heavily in consolidated car parks, knowing they would carry out the work if the deal went through. When the price of their shares went up, she sold out and made a small fortune. Mm. Are you all right, Mr Bristow? You've gone pale. Uh, I'll be OK. I feel rather faint. Could you bring me a glass of water? Sparkling. Anything. It's good for jeans. Have sparkling. There's a future in sparkling water. Miss Sunman bought shares in it this morning. Uh. Mr Bristow? Mr Bristow? Will someone help? Mr Bristow's fainted. Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, Dora Bryan as Mrs Purdy, John Glover as Fudge and the Station Master, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman, Simon Schatzberger as the Post Boy and Carol Starks as Miss Peach and the Lift Boy, with David Batley as Fred Stokes. The music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. The sound recording was by Graham Harper. The director, Neil Cargill. Before the office on BBC TV, there was Bristow, Frank Dickens' cartoon strip featuring rounded, balding men in suits discussing office politics. Based on that came this series, first broadcast back in 1999 and starring Michael Williams as Chester Perry's troublesome buying clerk. Today, Bristow incites a little more rebellion in the ranks as he attempts to smuggle a food inspector into the staff canteen. <laughs> Bristow by Frank Dickens, with Michael Williams as Bristow and Rodney Bewes as Jones. Follow that star. Napoleon once said, an army marches on its stomach. But if you ask me, the fellow was talking through his chapeau because he hadn't tried our chef's beef wellington. This is designed to anchor us firmly to our office desks, and the only time we do marching is when we do something wrong and we get our marching orders. The subject of food was very close to our minds then, when Jones and I were on our way to the firm's three-star canteen one day. Three stars. Oh, that's a love. They owe me that canteen. If it weren't for me, they wouldn't have three stars in the firm's canteen good food guide. It was Friday lunchtime. Hmm. Bristow, we must be out of our minds eating here. Mm. We're handing them back the money we slave all week for. And the food isn't worth it. Mr Gordon Blue, the chef, takes the best stuff home. No, nonsense. 
The flesh cup is the food that covers the firm's name on the plate. In any case, he only takes it because he has a wife and five starving children to support. On the Monday of the following week, I got out of bed and went across to the window. The view from this window is positively breathtaking. Far away to my left, I can see the Chester Perry building, like a matchbox on the horizon. And far away to my right, what appears to be a toy train steaming into a miniature station. <laughs> Holy mackerel! It's the 815 commuter special! <laughs> Late again! I late. I'm so late I've even missed the late, late crowd. I'm with the so late it's hardly worth going in for, Brigade. <laughs> yeah, morning, Mr. Stationmaster. Morning, sir. You do run trains during the day, I suppose. During the time people are working in offices and so on. The rails are still being used, kept nice and shiny, as it were. Somebody once told me that railway lines weren't safe unless you could see your face in them. Anything in that? Here comes a train now, sir. Allow me, sir. Uh, very kind of you. Very kind. Thank you. Are you comfortable, sir? Yes, thank you. Ready when you are, Captain. Oh, change! <laughs> I can't understand, Sir Reginald. He has his name written right across the front of the building, but it's too low down. You ought to have it higher up, across the top, where it can be seen from miles away. The R.L. Chester Perry Company. P.S. If you can read this, you are too close. Excuse me, sir. Do you work for this company? Of course I do. Can't you tell by the pallid face, the nervous twitch and the jerky movements? The Chester Perry trademark. Why do you ask? Oh, I hope you don't mind my asking, but is the canteen inside the building? It depends what's on the menu. If they're cooking anything with garlic in it, we seal the place off. May I ask why the interest? I'd like to go for a meal there. Oh, funny. Don't look like a head case. Although, from the side, there is a hint of village idiot. Would you like a punch on the jaw? Oh, you're a hothead. You're wasting your time trying to get into the canteen if you are a hothead. If you take offence at a little thing like that, you wouldn't last five minutes. Huh? You wouldn't get past the condiments. James Cagney in prison landing there. Long tables in the big hall. Atmosphere. Fights and scuffles breaking out every few seconds. And that's before the flavour of the food gets through to everyone. Do they pay you to go round upsetting people? They don't pay us full stop. Still, there's talk of some money when our ship comes in. And there's a hint of holidays and a rumour of good times being just around the corner. So it's better than a job with no prospects at all. Well, it's been nice meeting you, so I'll say goodbye and good luck. Oh, wait a minute. I am B.J. Bothwick, an inspector for the firm's canteen good food guide, and my magazine want me to do a write-up of the Chester Perry restaurant. Well, can you help? I'll make it worth your while. Look, I can't stop now. Meet me at lunchtime round the back by the dustbins. You can't miss them. We have hundreds of them. We have dustbins, like other firms, have hot dinners. Morning, Jones. You've missed the best bit. Fudge had Hewitt in a corner, chased him across to the filing cabinet, then back to the window, shouting at the top of his voice all the time. Wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, eh? <laughs> Listen, Jones, I met a man outside just now who wants to eat in the firm's canteen. He can't. What do you mean, he can't? Just that. He can't. Outsiders are not allowed. Are you telling me that if I had someone important come to see me and it was lunch hour, I couldn't take him into the canteen? Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying it. It's rules. The canteen is for employees. Otherwise, we'd have every Tom, Dick and Harry in there. And since when have you known anyone important? Hmm? Fudge wants me. Oh, it's so long since he called me into his office, I've, I've forgotten how to arrange my features. What sort of expression shall I go in with? Contrite is best. He doesn't shout so much as contrition. Hello? 
What's this written in the dust on my desktop? Tom Woods, caretaker, wishes to meet Florid Desmond of the cleaning staff. Object, friendship, stroke, marriage. <laughs> He's incorrigible, that Tom. <sighs> Eight hours to go. Eight hours. That's 648 minutes. 60 times 648 is 38,880 seconds to go. 38,808 seconds to go. Oh, one, two, three, four. Be Jones, you better sit down. What on earth is the matter? You look dazed. What on earth did Fudge say? He didn't say much. I bumped my head on the door frame as I was backing out. Well, what did he want? Have we got a paint shop? Yes, on the other side of the yard, next to the garage. Do you know a Reg Pothelthwaite? Yes, very thin. Slate grey hair, porcelain blue eyes, silver birch moustache and a pale pink complexion. You won't have any problem recognising him. Here's a colour chart. Bristow, the other day... I decided to take stock of my life. I stood in front of the mirror and took a long, searching look at myself. And your conclusions? None, whatsoever. I couldn't see myself properly. My eyes were too full of tears. Because all I am at this firm is a messenger boy. I've got to take this order down to Postlethwaite in the paint shop and wait for an answer. I ask you, what kind of job is that for a grown man? It isn't as if I don't try. If ever there was a company man, it's me. I love this company. Bristow, if I should ever quit and go abroad to seek my fortune, think only this of me. There is some corner of a foreign firm that is forever Chester Perry's. 87, 88, 89. Jones, about that matter of the firm's canteen, are there rules about taking people in? Of course there are rules. And the barbed wire and the Alsatian dogs are there to enforce the rules. That's all I am to this firm. A messenger boy. Why he can't pick up a phone and talk to the man himself? 103. 104. <laughs> Daily things? I wonder whether you can help. I am a regular reader of your excellent newspaper, but... That is, I was a regular reader until I fell upon hard times. Get to the point? I'm getting to the point. Can someone read out the Sitz Vac pages? Hello? 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 Morning, Mr. Bristow. Hewitt! What's up? Oh, you frightened the life out of me with that pink shirt and pink tie. I thought for a second it was a plunging neckline. Mr. Bristow. Can I ask you a question? If it's the question I think it is, my answer is that when you're older, you realise all the time I'm sitting here, apparently doing nothing, I'm chipping away at the establishment. That wasn't the question. I was going to ask if you've been at the same desk ever since you've been here. And the answer is no. It was over in that corner until the great tea trolley disaster. After that, everyone in the building was shuffled around. Listen, Hewitt... I met a man outside this morning who wants to have lunch in our canteen. He can't. What do you mean, he can't? Isn't there some rule against it? I think there is. I believe those bouncers at the entrance are there to stop that sort of thing. Tea and cakes are on you today. Since when? Since we had a bet yesterday for a thousand million billion trillion pounds and I won. A thousand million billion trillion pounds? And I won. Fancy you remembering that. Come and get it. Good Lord. This is Dimple of the canteen. What are you doing here? Where's Mrs. Purdy? On holiday. I'm her standing. Oh, are you really? Let me taste your wares. <laughs> In my opinion, Mr. Hewitt, you can tell a lot about a tea lady by the first sip. <laughs> Come on. <clears throat> you were born under the sign of Aquarius, the water carrier. Why are you stirring it as fast as that? It's a new theory of mine. I'm hoping the centrifugal force will drive any flavour that's in it to the outside. Mr. Bristow, judging by last week's bill, I assume you had a rough week. Mm. Monday, tea and cakes. Tuesday, tea and cakes and a sedative. Wednesday, tea and a sedative. Thursday, tea and a sedative. Friday, tea and a sedative. Let me see that. How much? 
Have you a sedative on the trolley? Before you came in, Mr Bristow was telling me he has invited someone for lunch in the firm's canteen. He can't do that. It's against the rules. You should know that. And the first rule when you get a job with the Chester Perry Company is that you have to cut yourself off from the outside world. News to me. It's the small print. Comes after renouncing all pleasures of the flesh. I didn't know that either. I'd like to see a copy of these rules. No, you're not allowed to. Rule, rule three. three. Hard act to follow. Uh, hard act to follow without slipping up. I don't know what you noticed, but a tear was leaking. As I was saying before we were so rudely interrupted, this man who wants to have lunch in the canteen works for the firm's canteen good food guide and he wants to do a write-up. Mr Bristow, if you'll take my advice, you'll have nothing to do with him. I'm going to check on these rules. Uh, uh, buying department, can I help you? No, Mr Simpson is one of our salesmen. He doesn't work in the building. Uh, what's today? Wednesday? Today he'll be starting his town calls. I don't know whether he'll be calling on Snowgrove and Ashton. I know that he'll be calling on the Dog and Duck, the Queen's Elm, the Bellside Tavern, the Windsor Castle. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Be like that then. Now then, yeah, where was I? About this man, Alice. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Bristow, I don't want to get involved. I've got work to do. <laughs> Morning, Mr. Bristow. Morning, Mr. Hewitt. No, don't shut it, I'm going. See you later. <laughs> Yeah, well, Miss Sunman, and how can I help you? I just thought you might like to know that the collection for Mr Radford's retirement came to £125. Oh, yeah, £125 for ten years' work, eh? Mm. Five days a week, less holidays, less public holidays and Christmas. Yes, it bears out the old Chester Perry maxim. He shall have but a penny a day. <laughs> That's most interesting. And has cheered up what so far has been an uneventful morning. In return... Let me ask you a question. Suppose, and I know this is stretching the imagination to the point of incredulity here, just suppose you were married. Yes, Mr. Bristow. And your husband called on you just before lunchtime. Would you take him to the canteen? Oh, the firm's canteen? Mm. Would I take him to the firm's canteen? If he was hungry, very hungry, like ravenous, like he hadn't eaten for days. The firm's canteen. If he was weak from hunger, begging for food, and the firm's canteen was, well, where it is, and there was nowhere else to go. Well, I suppose if there was nowhere else to go, and he is hungry, as you say, yes, I suppose I'd take him there. But suppose the rule said you can't. You're not allowed to take outsiders into the canteen. Then I'd tell him you'll have to wait till we get home. <coughs> Miss Sunman, he'll never make it home. He's dying of hunger. The canteen is the only one thing that can save him. Would you break the rule? I know, I know. Go on, yes, yes, go on. I'd say, wait there, and I'd go into the canteen and I'd get a takeaway. Oh, I'd... Forget it. But uh, I... It's not important. Now tell me the real reason you came in here. It wasn't to tell me about Radford's retirement collection, was it? Tell me the truth. I wondered whether you'd finished with your newspaper. Oh, you surprised me, Miss Sunman. I wouldn't have said you were the type that ever read a newspaper. Take it. Thank you. I like this one. <laughs> On every page there's something about love. Oh, I think you are confused. This is a businessman's newspaper. High finance, wheeling and dealing. I know. But I read between the lines. Bye. Oh. 386. 387, 300... Morning, Mr. B. Uh, morning, postboy. Can I ask you a question? Fire away. Considering the way you speak about the firm, why do you have a picture of the Chester Perry building on the wall behind you? Psychology. Psychology? Yeah. Every time I look over my shoulder, I think I'm on my way home. Mr. Bristow, what's it like to live a mundane existence? Oh, how do I know? Stuck in the office all day. Here, yeah, postboy, let me pick your brains what do you know about the canteen? Do you ever eat there? Do I ever go to the canteen? Mm. The canteen here? Yeah. Are you kidding? I'm surprised it's still open. Why's that? Got no stars, has it? No stars, no rosettes, no recommendations, no awards, nothing. And you know why? Mm. That chef is a quack. He doesn't know his duck à l'orange from his filet de sole bon fan. Ah. That canteen is a no-no, a nothing. A blot on the gastronomic landscape 
course I don't go there. Really? You go there. I'm going there today with an inspector from the firm's canteen good food guide. You're wasting your time, Mr. B. Mm. Both your time and his time. And you're wasting your money. Because it's not cheap. They say it's cheap. They say it's subsidised. But you still pay through the nose. Mm. It costs an arm and a leg to eat there, and you still come out ravenous. And you know why that is? No. It's because they don't want you falling asleep at your desk in the afternoon. Yeah. They want you to be alert and on your toes. They give you little portions, but they dress them up to look big. All that bechamel sauce. Blech. All that chestnut puree. Double. Blech. And who's to blame? Mm. The management, of course. If they wanted to do this firm a favour, they should round up all the kitchen staff, march them out into the yard and... <laughs> and after that, hire a new lot. Then, and only then, with new faces and new ideas, would it start making money? And, more important, give value for money. And that's what it's all about, Mr B. Value. Oh, you've obviously given this matter a great deal of thought. Thought? I can't think, Mr B. I'm only a postboy. We don't think. We just run around delivering letters. We aren't capable of thinking or thought. We aren't paid to think. The morning passed. And as soon as I heard the firing of the starting pistol signifying the lunch break, I ran downstairs and, using one of the many escape tunnels, found myself in the yard. There was no way of getting out into the street without being strip-searched by the security people. And, because they locked the gates as soon as the staff were inside in the morning, it was impossible to get to the dustbins on the other side of the wall. I therefore had to take a chance. The wind being in the right direction, I was quickly able to pick up the scent of that day's first attempt at filet de boeuf mignon with pommes frites from the dustbin area and was standing by the wall on the other side to that of the man I had come to meet. Psst! Psst! Hello? Is anyone over there? Yes. Is it Mr. Bodwick? Yes. I can't hear you. Can you stand on the dustbin? <laughs> How's that? Are you all right? Knock three times on the dustbin if you hear me. Twice on the lid if the answer is no. I'm OK. I, I, I can't hear you. Oh. How's that? Yeah, well, excellent. I'm afraid there's no way they will let strangers into the canteen. Sorry. Oh, but I've been hanging around all morning. When I said there's no way, there is a way, but is this report you're going to write important? Indeed so. It's the first time I've been able to give a star rating and therefore means a great deal. I have worked out a way to get you inside, but it's complicated. Well, let's do it. It's not straightforward. It doesn't matter. Let's go. It means you'll have to come down this side of the wall. Oh, stand back. I'll jump down. You're all right. Oh, oh, I, I think so. Oh, nothing broken, anyway. My suit's in a bit of a state. That won't show when you've got these overalls on. Overalls? It's the only way you'll ever get in. They run a pretty tight ship here. You've got to have a good excuse. If you're caught hanging around the yard, the bunches will be on us like a ton of bricks. Well, whose overalls are they? That's not important. Put them on. Yeah. I hope this is necessary. These overalls are rather tight. The owner must be a very small man. Of course, if you don't want to. All right, it's here. Let's just get on with it, shall we? Here's the hat. But that's a dustman's hat. That's right. Now pick up the bin and follow me. Pick up a dustbin? Certainly not. Now, let's get it clear. You want to get into the canteen, don't you? Oh, yes, but... All right. Oh. Oh, come on. It's my lunch hour. We're getting into trouble if we're not back at our desks by I two. I see what the dustbin has got to If do. we're caught, I'm going to say you were left behind by the other dustbin. I've got to cover my tracks as well, you know. I'm going out on a limb for you, and I don't even know you. I'm uh, grateful. Mm, that first bit was quite simple. Phase two is slightly more complicated. When whoever it is opens the door to let us in, we negotiate with them to borrow one of the canteen waitress coats that are hanging on the wall. Here we go. 
negotiate with and to borrow a canteen waitress for coat. Your white things, you must have seen them before. You're in the catering game. Yes, miss. Shh. Good gracious. Leg of lamb and cabbage bristle a vine, isn't it? What are you doing round the back? I was passing and I heard cries of distress. Upon investigation, I found it to be this gentleman. He had unfortunately been left behind by his fellow dustman. How could he be left behind? Tell her. Uh, uh, it was dusty, very dusty. That's right. I had a job to see him myself. There was that much dust. Well, he can't come in here in those clothes. Mr Gordon Blue is very particular about his kitchens. He don't want any dust men traipsing about. Of course not. But I see on the wall behind you some waitress coats. Perhaps he could borrow one of those to pass through the kitchen. Is that possible? Please. I really don't know whether I should. I think he should wash his hands before he even thinks of handing our nice white coats. Just look at the state of them. I thought dustmen were supposed to wear rubber gloves in the execution of their duties. It's all his fault they're like this. That's not my fault you fell off the wall. No, oh, pass me the coat. Not with hands like that. What's wrong with the tap on the garage wall? Mrs. Dimble, you are a star. Come this way, Bothwick. Hands out. Ready, steady. Yeah, darn so. Go on, sorry. You're turning off. Didn't that hurt your foot? No, years of kicking itinerant radiators have rendered it immune to pain. I'm soaked right through. Don't worry. You'll soon dry out. We'll have the steak flambéed at the table. Once we get you inside, everything will be fine. All we need now is an ID badge. An ID badge? And the man badge? who can supply that very thing is standing over there, forlorn, outside the paint shop. I give you Mr. Joe. Bristow? Is that you, Bristow? Jones? What are you doing here? I'm still waiting to get an answer from Reg Postlethwaite of the paint shop. Ah, he of the silver birch moustache and porcelain pink. Have you been waiting all this time? Over an hour. He's been in conference. Fudge doesn't think about these things when he Who is this chap? Who's your dustman friend? He's not a dustman. How silly of me. He's dressed in dustman's clothes and carrying a dustbin, so I assumed he was a dustman. Sorry. Is it absolutely necessary to waste time like this? Tut, tut. He's got a nasty temper, your friend. He's had a trying day, left behind by the other dustmen, unwanted, unloved. I'm not surprised, temper like that. He's a hothead, Bristow. Would you like a punch on the nose? And violent with it. He can't come in here. We don't want any rough stuff in our canteen. Our customers come in for a bit of peace and quiet of a lunchtime. I think security should be informed. Jones, we don't want security. We'd like to borrow your ID badge for a few minutes. I'm trying to get my friend into the canteen. Is this the chap you were talking about this morning? Yes. He wants to do a write-up of the firm's canteen. Lend this thug my ID? Mm. Are you kidding? I think we should blow the whistle on him this minute. I think you ought to stay out of things. You cause enough trouble as it is. <laughs> There's gratitude. Mrs. Dimple, call security. I already have. At the first sign of violence, I'll press the button. Violence? You clenched your fists. I recognise the stages. I weren't born yesterday. They'll be here in a minute. My God, I don't want to be involved. Get me out of here. It's a madhouse. Somebody get me out of here. I'll give you a star in the food guide. Call off one of the dogs. Two stars in the guide. Call off two. Three stars. Three. We don't go higher than three. What do you think, Jones? Escape tunnel. Escape tunnel it is. Follow me. So that's how we came to get three stars. And the nice thing is that they tightened up on security since then, and no one will ever get in to dispute it. Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Christopher Benjamin as Bothwick, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman, John Glover as the Station Master, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy, with Sheila Reed as Mrs Dimple.
music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. The sound recording was by Graham Harper. The director, Neil Cargill. And next week, not unusually, Bristow bemoans his life in the buying department, but then the new girl starts work in the office opposite, causing a fluttering in the male dovecots of the Chester Perry building. Desert Island Discs Revisited on BBC Radio 4 Extra. This is a life. To wait to the sound of birdsong, know that it is Saturday morning, and have that wonderful feeling of relief flooding all over me. Oh, I think I'll lie here all day. Oh, oh, oh. Lie here and let my sleep drug brain bask like a whale luxuriating in the deep waters of the. Holy mackerel! It's Monday! Bristow by Frank Dickens with Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones and Dora Bryan as Mrs Purdy. The Girl Next Door. What's it like working as a buying clerk at Chester Perry's? Have you ever had a tooth pulled without an anaesthetic? Have you ever tumbled down a mountainside, striking rocks and boulders as you fell? and sustained sharp cuts and serious bruising? Have you ever had wedges of wood hammered under your fingernails? That's what it's like working at Chester Perry's. Up until tea break. Then it gets progressively worse. Bristow! Morning. I'm only joking, of course. It's not a bad firm, really. And let's face it, the management are pretty free and easy. We can come in any time before nine and leave any time after five. But I've got them where I want them. Because I'm writing an expose on big business to warn children about the sort of problems they face when they leave school to join the rat race. For example, a lot of young people who start their first job take it too seriously. They take their work home with them. Wrong! You've got to learn to close the door behind you. It takes time to realise this doesn't happen overnight and you're forever learning let's take a look at last week from the top good morning station master mm. it's a funny thing i was thinking about you the other day mm? strange isn't it that if i were to meet you somewhere else and you were out of uniform i probably wouldn't recognize you even though I've seen you every working day for the past seven years. That is, a total of 1,355 times. Don't you find that strange? I do indeed, sir, but considering you've said exactly the same thing to me on each and every one of the 1,355 occasions to which you refer, I find it not only strange, but positively weird. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have a station to run. <whistles> you run it, do you? Trains are still on the agenda. The thing that Stevenson had in mind all those years ago, getting people from A to B, you still do that sort of thing? It's actually run. You surprised me. I didn't realise it was run. I've always thought it was frozen in time. There it is. The Chester Perry Building, a miracle of modern construction. It took an army of workmen two years to build that place. Just give me a pickaxe, 24 hours, and a demolition order. It's 
Wrong kind of music for a start. Ought to be something like the Death March. Uh, that's more like it. I've only been in the building 25 seconds, and already it's fed up to the back teeth time. Stand aside, Jones. Any place I hang my hat is open. Uh, don't, Bristow. Yeah. The window's open. Oh, too late. It'll have landed in the gutter. Windows are not supposed to be open until June the 3rd. Uh, I say. Look at this, Jones. Bristow, come away. Somebody might see you. Jones, there's a new girl in the office across the street. Don't be ridiculous. You're only saying that to get me to... Good heavens. Wowie. How about that? Steady on. You're drooling all over the windowsill. Oh, is my tie straight? I should have worn my best suit. Jones, you're a married man. Uh, what makes you say that? Y you mean you're not? I'm not saying I'm not. What makes you say I am? Well, I always assumed that. I haven't really given the matter, really. When a crowd of us came round to your place to play cards that night, you turned someone's photograph to the wall. That doesn't mean I'm married. Could have been anyone. Could have been my mother. Could have been a relative. Which photograph was it? I don't know. You turned it to face the wall the minute the cards came out. Here, let me think of it. Someone with glasses. Lots of people have got glasses. Oh, isn't she a beauty? Just calm down. Stand back. Let me close the window. Leave the window alone. I want it open. All right. I'd never heard that note in Jones's voice before. He sounded almost human for a second, and it set me thinking. Although we'd been working in the same office for seven years, we never really knew much about each other. We were still comparative strangers, touch wood, and the only thing we had in common was the job. I decided... And this is where I made my first mistake. Take heed, young wannabe, to get to know more about him. Isn't it funny how other offices all seem much better than your own? That place over there seemed almost friendly. Sort of place you can walk into without that knife between the shoulder blades feeling you get when you walk in here. Oh, and look at those flowers. How long since you've seen flowers in an office? Her eyes are the blue of the dainty cornflower. Mm. Her dress the hue of the nodding violet. Her lips the colour of the wild rose. Keep your voice down or we'll have fudge coming out. Crimson the colour of his angry face. Yellow the streak that runs down our backs. But look at those cakes. Why don't we get cakes like that? Jam donuts, cream slices, coconut macaroons and cherry tarts. Curses. There goes the one I fancy. Come away from the window, Jones. People will be starting to talk. Bristow, it's not what you're thinking. I'm standing here because it's interesting. What do you think all those people do out there? Why aren't they stuck in a stuffy office like us? How come they're all walking the streets when we are chained to our desks? Oh, it's made obvious. They are millionaire playboys. They can't all be millionaire playboys. Not all of them. Most of them. The others are lottery winners buying furniture. Hello? There's Sir Reginald Chester Perry's car pulling up outside. And our beloved firm's foundry is being set down. My word. He has aged. His face is lined with worry. Worry? Think of multi-millionaire business tycoon worries. Those are laughter lines. That means the canteen will be laying on something special today. Shall we eat there? Not likely. They put the prices up when he's here. You mean you're barred again? Barred? Who's barred? <clears throat> Canteen, what gastronomic feast are you offering today? My name is Bristow, B-R-I-S-T-O-W. B for braised beef, R for rabbit pie, I for Irish stew, S for sausage, T for toad, as in toad in the old, and W for Vienna schnitzel. I'd like to know what's on the menu today. <laughs> How dare you? And the same to you with knobs of butter on. Damn sauce. So it's the park. Did you bring sandwiches? No. We can always eat berries. We've done it before, when we had the trouble with the accounts department. Ah, but that was in the winter, when there were berries about. Mm. Hold it. Problem solved. It's raining out there. It can't be. But sunshine a minute ago. Is there a rainbow? Sure is. Come on, let me see that. There's supposed to be a crock of gold where the rainbow ends. 
Good heavens, it's true. It finishes up outside accounts. Ah, canteen it is. If you can get in, that is. Ah, I can get in if I really want to. Just means I have to wear a mask. I'll make one out of these invoices. Brister, we must be stupid eating in the firm's canteen. Mm. We are just giving them back the money we work for. In fact, they make a profit out of us. A chef like Mr Gordon Blue doesn't come cheap. And the fact that he can experiment with the food the way he does leaves a nasty taste in the mouth every day. Can I take your order? Oh, hello, Mr Jones. Long time no see. Hello, Mrs Buxton. The truth is we've been eating in the park of late, but now the weather has changed, we've decided to come back here. Return of the prodigal, as it were. <laughs> Fatted calves off. Oh, what have you got? Tender chunks of specially selected Scottish beef cooked in rich, thick gravy in golden, feather-like pastry, accompanied by crisp, golden French fried potatoes. Meat pie and chips twice. I like the new crockery. So elegant. Willow pattern, isn't it? Sort of. The picture tells the story anyway. Two employees sneaking out over a humpback bridge with Sir Reginald in hot pursuit. And I like the way the knives and forks are chained to the side of the plates. Where do the Miles and Rudge people go for lunch? Oh, forget it, Jones. A look like her probably goes to a Swiss restaurant with one of the directors. Shan't be a moment. Yet for heaven's sake, sit down. You're making an exhibition of yourself. Next morning, I got in early. I could tell the cleaning ladies had been hard at work. My seat was still warm and the end of my pencil had been chewed. Jones was standing by the window. What's the matter? Couldn't you sleep? I was just watching the world out there come to life, as it were. A kaleidoscope of colour and movement. Milkmen making their deliveries, postmen hurrying from door to door with their heavy sacks. The comings and goings of the cleaning staff, late-night revellers making their way home. Fascinating, wonderful, inspiring. Brings out the poet in you. And doesn't she, though? Uh, it's fudging. Oh, he's in all right, and already had a go at Hewitt. He asked Hewitt to do something, and Hewitt answered back. <coughs> Hewitt answered back? Well, he didn't exactly answer back. He just didn't say yes, sir, quick enough. Fatal. Where the devil is Mrs Purdy, the tea lady? Ah, methinks I hear her Winnebago, e'en as we speak. Warm and plenty of hard bake. Morning, Mr. Jones. Lovely day. Oh, is it? I wouldn't know. Weather to me is just something on the other side of the window. Talking of windows, and look at that. There's a new girl working across the road. Suit you all right, eh, Mr. Jones? <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Mrs. Paddy. What comestibles have you on board today? Oh, get you. Comestibles, eh? <laughs> Swallowed a dictionary, have you? Do you have any of your homemade lighters of feather fairy cakes? I thought you didn't like my homemade lighters of feather fairy cakes. What are you talking about? Finest paperweights in the business. <laughs> your coconut macaroons look nice. Ah, oh, nice. Well, I think I'll take one of those. How much are they? 25p. 25p? Sorry, Mr Bristow. The price of coconut's gone up. Revolution in the country or something. Isn't it marvellous? Every single solitary action, man-made or otherwise, far or near, that happens on the face of this earth, hits me in the pocket. I'll have a nice cup of hot tea. You'll have it like the rest of us, served at room temperature. I'll have a weakest star geeling with a sliver of lemon, a whisper of sugar, served in a white china cup, shaken, not stirred. Coming up. Stand back. <laughs> Holy mackerel! How long have you been here, Mrs Purdy? Twelve years. Yes. No. Twelve years, man and boy, eh? And how many cups of succulent tea have you served up in that time? Thousands, hundreds of thousands. What's the secret? Trial and error. Stand back. I'm soaked. Pass me one of those invoices, Jones. Tea doesn't stain, does it? Mrs Purdy's does. She puts something in it specially. Good morning, Mr Bristow. Morning, Mr Jones. Mm. Morning, Mrs Purdy. Oh, look... 
There's a new girl started in the office across the road. So you, Mr. Jones. <laughs> we'll have no time for the girls here now. Ooh, nice dress. What do I wish you got that from? Marks and Spencer are doing them. My daughter's got one exactly the same. Uh, ladies, please. You are at work. She won't be there long. What makes you say that? She's too attractive. Lookers never last long. They join a firm, they cause a lot of trouble and leave. My daughter does it all the time. Takes after her mother, does she? <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell, Jones is suddenly on top of his form. It's that girl over there has got him going. We won't get any more work from him today. On the Wednesday, I arrived to find Miss Sunman and Jones both standing by the window. She's not all that attractive. I don't know. I don't know, really, I don't. Look at all the men round her. I wish she worked here. Oh, Mr Jones, you're a married man. Who told you that? Uh, Mr Bristow said mm. that when he came round to play cards at your place... I know, I know. He saw me turn a photograph to the wall. With glasses. I know all about the glasses. I'm <laughs> sick of hearing about the glasses. How many more people are you going to tell? Mm. I'm surprised you haven't got anything better to do. <laughs> Mr Bristow... I wonder whether you'd mind listening to some of your dictation. I can't make head nor tail of it. Fire away. <clears throat> Read your letter of the 14th. What a lot of nonsense. What rubbish. What drivel. What a waste of time, money and materials. What a shambles. What rot. What bunkum. What piffle. What does it mean, Mr Bristow? It means I left the machine on when I was skimming through the bumper spring number of the house journal. Oh, but that was the golden anniversary number. 200 issues. I think it's marvellous. Marvellous? I think it's incredible. Considering each issue is worse than the last, I'd say it's a downright miracle. You're only saying that because your name wasn't in it. That's the only way they get people to read it, by filling it with names. After all, it's a human weakness to want to see your name in print. Personally, I think anyone who's never been mentioned ought to go down in a firm's roll of honour. If you feel like that, <coughs> why are you carrying a copy in your pocket? For your information, I'm going to lunch in the park. And judging by the amount of rain that fell during the night, the seat may be damp. Assuming I can sort out this letter, how many copies do you want? Six, please. Six? You want six Miss copies? Miss Sunman, I hate repeating myself. Right you are, Mr Bristow. Yes? Uh, get me Mr Williams of Davis Piers. What do we say? Uh, Mary, don't mess about Mr Williams, please. the line, please. Hello? Mr. Williams, please. Hold the line. Hello? Mr. Williams? Oh, no, they put you through to the wrong office by mistake. Hold oh. the line. Hello? You put me through to the wrong... Hello? Hello? Miss? Miss? <sighs> Mary, dear, could you please get the new line management? This is Hugh line management. If you know the extension you want, please press it now. Mm -mm. Alternatively, follow these instructions. Mm. For production, press 1. For finance, press 2. For development, press 3. Oh. For publicity, press 4. Oh. For transport, press 5. Mm -hmm. For general purposes, Press six. Yeah, gotcha. Six it is. Please hold the line. <laughs> Welcome to Hugh Line Management General Purposes. If you have an inquiry on general services, oh. press one. If you have an inquiry on specific purpose, press two. Gotcha. Two it is. Welcome <laughs> to specific purposes. Hold the line, please. If you wish to speak to Jonathan Cheveley, press one. If you wish to speak to Freddie Pilkington, press two. Alternatively, uh. hold the line. <coughs> Hello? Hello? Uh. Letter to Mrs. Kerwin and Company. Dear Sirs, our order number DB392 was urged by us on the 20th Ultimo, but no reply has been received. Perhaps you will have the courtesy to answer this time, you lazy good-for-nothing pig. P.S. If a reply has been sent in the last seven days, kindly disregard this letter. Afternoon, postboy. Cheer up. It's not the end of the world. 
It might just as well be. Hmm? What a pathetic life we lead, Mr Bristow. There are so many things I should have seen and done instead of being stuck in a building like this. I've never seen the pyramids, the Acropolis, the Sugarloaf Mountain, the Niagara Falls, the Taj Mahal by moonlight. That's nothing. I've never seen the office clock with the big hand on the twelve and the small hand on the five. Any mail for me? Postcard from Miss Cleave, on holiday in the Austrian Alps. Mm. Having a wonderful time in this fairy tale village. Fleecy clouds dance happily around the snow capped mountain tops, covered in little Christmas trees, and everyone is very friendly. Yesterday I had my bottom pinched by a lonely goat herd. See what I mean? Everyone is having fun except me. Mr. Bristow, I'm looking for fun, games, and excitement. So am I. But it's so long since I've had any, I doubt whether I'd recognise fun, games, and excitement if I saw them. For the rest of the day, Jones was strangely quiet and I took advantage of this to put in a solid afternoon's work. Yes? Mary, get me my opposite number to Gun and Fame. Say please. Mary, we've had this before. Don't mess up. Oh, please, Mary. Please, Mary, dear. Mary, I'm in a hurry. Please, Mary, dear. Who do you want? My opposite number, I've already told you. Hold on. Gun and Fames, T-Boy speaking. This is the Chester Perry Company. I'd like to speak to someone about an order of ours. Uh, Troublemaker, eh? Hold on, I'll put you through. Hello? This is Bristow. Hold but... on. Turn that down, lads. Hello? Is anyone there? <coughs> this is Bristow of Chester Perry. Hang on, I can't hear a thing. Make a little less noise with those teacups, lads. Who at Chester Perry's? <sighs> Bristow, B-R-I-S-T-O-W. B for Benjamin, R for Roger, I for Ivor, S for Stanley, T for Tommy, O for Oliver, W for William. And my Christian names are... Is there something wrong with this line? Oh, sorry about that. A couple of lads playing ping-pong with a cracked ball. Cut it out, lads! Uh, Mr Bristow, you said, what can I do for you? It's about an order of ours we placed seven months ago. No, as long as that. Yeah. I don't think it is, you know. It, it, it certainly is. Hang on. George, what was the date on that paper aeroplane Fred was throwing about the other day? Was it? I've uh, a chap here asking about it. What do you want me to tell him? He won't go for that. But I'll stall. Uh, Mr Bristow, yeah. you'll have to call back later. Yeah, but, 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 oh. If I had to draw a circle around a moment in time and say this is the most boring moment in my life, I would draw that circle now. <laughs> and I would draw another one now. And now. And now. Mr. Stowe, deal with this. <laughs> yes, Mr. Fudge. Certainly, Mr. Fudge. Right away, Mr. Fudge. The, who opened that window? It was warm in here. I don't want this window open. Can you keep it closed, you hear? Your behaviour of late leaves a lot to be desired, and unless you pull yourself together, you'll find yourself looking for another job. You lazy, indolent, bungling... Can you ring back? I'm in conference. You were saying, Mr Fudge? What's the matter with you? Toothache? No, Mr Fudge. I strain? No, Mr Fudge. Toothache and I strain indeed. That man's a fool. I've been giving him the same look for seven years and he still doesn't recognise dumb insolence. There's no happy medium in this job. He either ignores me or goes berserk. <sighs> when I'm not on the shelf, I'm on the carpet. Oh, oh, Jones! The very man. Order number... Who closed the window? Uh, Fudge did. I want it open. That's down to you. Nothing to do with me. If Fudge asks... If Fudge asks, I opened it. OK? I couldn't understand it. This was not the yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir, character I'd known all these years. This was a fistful of dollars fighting man. And for what? For a girl in the office across the street who he didn't know. On the Friday, things came to a head. Morning, Bristol. Well, now, Samson of Sales, what are you doing in this neck of the woods? Come to see the girl, haven't I? Where is she? Oh, stand by, Jonesy. Let's have a look. 
Wow! How about that? That is very tasty indeed. Yes, sir. Oh. Hello, Mr. Bristow. Good morning, Miss Peach. What can I do for you? Uh, I, uh, now let me see. You've um, come to take a look at the girl across the street, haven't you? I want to see the dress. Excuse me. Yeah, oh, Miss Peach. Oh, stand back, Sam. So let the girl have a look. I like the oh. sleeves, but the neck's wrong with that hairstyle. Sorry, silly. She's gorgeous. Move on. Right, this is getting out of hand. They'll be selling tickets soon. Morning, Bristow. Morning, Dickens. Long time no see. Oh, I'm not often this way, but this morning I happen to be passing. The window's over there. Thank you. The trouble with offices is that news spreads like wildfire. You say something to someone, and words spread around in however long it takes Jones to walk round the building. Hello, Mr. B. Ah, uh, Connie from invoicing. Come in, window. Oh, thank you. I'm just interested in the hairstyle. Oh, Buying department, Bristow. Hello, Steve. What? Yes, you want to come up? Feel free. I warn you, there's quite a little crowd. Hello, Bristow. Hang on. Hello, Bill. Window. Uh, Sorry, it's getting a trifle chaotic. Uh, See you in a minute. Bristow. Sorry to trouble you. Could we just move your desk back a bit and give us a bit more room? Well, it's a bit... I'm I'm trying to do some work. You don't have to move, Dinkins. Grab that end, eh? That's it. Oh, keep still, Bristol. Really? Window! No, no, you keep that end. Who is it? You'll have to speak up. I can't hear. Who? God, still can't. You'll have to ring back. (laughs) I said ring back later. I don't know how long this would have gone on for. But at its height, Fudge's door opened and... What the devil? Bristol! Jones! My office at once! I will draw a veil over the scene that followed. Sufficient to say that when I got home that evening, my head was still ringing. I decided to have an early night. As I was going up the stairs to my room, I was joined by my landlady's husband, Bert Hawkins. Uh, Mr. Bristow. Hello, Mr. Hawkins. Uh, Mrs. Hawkins was telling me you've had trouble with your sesh cord. Mm. Mind if I come and take a look? No, not at all. You're welcome. Would you like me to explain? Oh, that won't be necessary, Mr. B. I know my way around. Yes, he seems to have a habit of jamming up every now... Oh, I say. Mr. Bristow, come and have a look at this. Mm? Look, the flat across the road. The girl unpacking. Looks as if she's just moving in. Bit of all right, eh? And I'm a married man. I couldn't believe it. The same girl. Holy mackerel. Now I'm bringing my work home. Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Dora Bryan as Mrs Purdy, John Glover as Fudge, the Station Master, Samson and Hawkins, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman and Mary, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy and Dimkins, and Carol Starks as Miss Peach, Janet and Mrs Buxton. The music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. The sound recording was by Graham Harper. The director, Neil Cargill. Bristow's planning is holidays next week, and it's a toss-up between Stony Bridge on Sea or a week at Fun Boys. Now there's a choice. Now you might have heard interview guests are back in the comedy club. Here's John Holmes chatting to Nigel Planer. The Comedy Club on BBC Radio 4 Extra. About a year later would have been opening the comic strip. That's when it started to become noticed. Yeah. It became a group. We were a group. And it became more like a show. Alexi will come on. He will do that intro that we hear. Then, you know, we'll do 15, 20 minutes. Then it'll be so-and-so. Then in the beginning of the second half, it'll be the guest. Then it'll be the thing. Rick and Aid. And then Alexi to finish, and that you know it was it turned into a format a show once yeah. we got to the comic strip, which was great, very very funny show, 
But, you know, I used to get a little frustrated that it wasn't an environment where you could go down and test new material. You know, it wasn't a, a, you, you, we weren't writing new material by then. Yeah. The Comedy Club on BBC Radio 4 Extra, every night from 10 till midnight. And you can catch up with all of our interviews on BBC Sounds. by Frank Dickens, with Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, and Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy. Sun, Sea and Sabotage. to be a fly on the wall sometimes. Not being nosy, you understand, but really to assist my fellow men. I would like to have been a fly on the wall earlier on in the year, for example, when Jones and Hewitt, who both work alongside me in the buying department of the Chester Perry organisation, were discussing holidays. Hewitt, it's no good you going on about it. Risto always <clears throat> takes the last two weeks of July. Why? He just does! It's understood. It goes with the desk. Not this year, it doesn't. Oh, don't try and break with tradition, lad. And you better get off his desk. He'll be here in a minute. I couldn't care less about your silly old traditions. I'm taking the last two weeks in July. You, you mustn't think you can go around laying the law down. You've only been here 18 months. I don't care. It's irrelevant. I'm putting my name down for the last two weeks in July. Where are you going that's so important? That, too, is irrelevant. I don't have to tell you or anyone else where I'm going. I just want those weeks. As it happens, I'm not going anywhere. You are not going anywhere? No. This is the season for staying put. There's the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy, opera at Glyndebourne, Shakespeare in Regent's Park. Shakespeare? It's called Culture. Dear me. You should try it sometime. No, I'm not going anywhere. Everything I need is right here on my doorstep. And if I feel like enjoying it in the last two weeks in July, I will, mm. without having to think, does it suit Bristow? I shouldn't tell him that. Why not? I just shouldn't. That's all. I can't understand you. If you're not going anywhere in particular, why rock the boat? Principle. I don't see why I should have to jump when he jumps. But if you've nothing booked... All right. Let's say I'm booked in somewhere, whatever. OK? Fine. Fine, fine. But you tell him. I want no part of this. I'll tell him. Not being a fly on the wall, I know nothing of the foregoing, of course. I'm taking a day off sick um, before I go down and clean the car and do the thousand and one things the flesh is heir to. I'm in bed, wondering whether I should take my annual holidays at Stony Beach on Sea or whether I should try Fun Boys sur la plage. When Shakespeare said, if all the year were playing holidays, to sport would be as tedious as to work, he was spouting errant nonsense, as anyone from the Chester Perry organisation will tell you. Holidays are taken very seriously indeed at this firm, and no one takes them more seriously than yours truly. A week at Stony Beach on Sea brings a sparkle to the eyes and a glow to the skin, while a week at Fun Boys simply makes the hair stand on end and a promise to do better next time. The toss of a coin being of no help whatsoever, since I lost it in the bedclothes, I decided to make enquiries. Yeah? Fun Boys? Who wants them? My name is Bristow. Bristow, B-R-I-S-T-O-W. B as in body beautiful, R for rude as in rude health, I for invigorating, S for solid as in solid muscle, 
T for toes, for the touching of O, for the effect over all, W for... Yeah. It's about holidays. It's about holidays. Give me the phone. Let go of it, Desmond. Good morning, caller. How can I help? I'm calling about reservations for your hotel at Stony Beach. I stayed there last year. You stayed there last year? And you're rebooking? And that's right. A rebooking? Break open the champagne, Desmond. <laughs> That's how easy it is to book a holiday. Simply pick up a telephone, a few words, and bingo, it's finished. How different, though, from the devious dithering that awaited me upon my arrival at work the next day. Morning, Jones. Lovely day. Who opened that window? Hewitt. Uh, Hewitt's not allowed to open windows. Only here five minutes. He has no respect for tradition, that lad. You'll have to be told. How are you feeling? Fine. Why? You were off sick yesterday, remember? Mm, so I believe. They tell me I was in a coma most of the time, but I'm blessed with an iron constitution. I trust you weren't here when he opened the window. With the window open, anyone on the staff might have been seized with an uncontrollable urge to throw themselves out. No, no, no. I wasn't here as it happened. Yeah, these young lads have to be watched, always trying to assert themselves. I see the cleaning ladies have been in. The end of my pencil has been chewed to ribbons. Uh, the uh, postboy's been round with the holiday list. The dates have to be in today. Of course they do. These things have to be organised. <laughs> I'm OK. I'm taking the first two weeks of July. And I'm taking my usual. July. Last two weeks. Why don't you take the first two weeks in August? Hmm? Fudge is on holiday, then. Go on holiday at the same time as Fudge. Not likely. You might catch me enjoying myself on a beach somewhere. Anyway, I like to be here when he's on holiday. That's when I get my office holiday. What about the last two weeks in August? You get a whole month that way. Plenty of sunshine, too. No, it's too hot, then. In any case, I can't wait. I've already got my swimming costume on under my trousers. Can't you be a little bit more flexible? Rules are rules. Holiday dates, everyone. We haven't quite finalised them. I'll be back in two minutes. What do you mean we haven't quite finalised it? You go on the first two weeks of July, I go on the last two. Hewitt fits in. What could be more final than that? Morning, Mr Bristow. Who closed the window? The moment I set eyes on him, I should have known there was something going on. Last time I saw that look on his face was when he was in the firm's canteen and they told him he had to eat his greens. A look of youthful obstinacy. But I am a man in whom is no guile. I don't see treachery in people because there is none in myself. Who closed the window? I did. Bristow's just come back from being ill, remember? It's very close in here. When do I get a window? You haven't been here long enough to get a window. Anyway, what do you want a window for? I might want to look out of it. I might want to lean out of it. I might even want to jump out of it. Before you do so, perhaps you'll give some thought to your holiday dates. Holiday dates? Mm. Um, yeah, abroad. I've, I've booked to go abroad. I've got my money changed and everything. Uh, I've got a good exchange rate, too. Even some of those tapes that teach you the language. I didn't want to go in, <clears throat> but uh, it was the only time they could fit me in. It, it's going to be a perfect holiday. Everything I need. Plenty of excitement, wine, women and song. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Wine, women and song. The bit before that. The tapes. Hmm. Voice tapes no. to teach you the language. No, the month. You said... Yeah. Well, I was saying I didn't want it then, but they, that is the travel agent, said that's the only time they could fit me in. Sounds like... Yeah. Are we talking about July? Um... Yes. <laughs> July. Out of the question. Jones and I always go in July. He has the first two weeks and I have the last two. You'll have to change the bookie, I'm afraid. Well, I can't. I've tried. They said no. They are booked for the whole season. Those are the only two weeks available. Mm, they always try that. A lot of nonsense. Did it through a travel agency, did you? Well... Yeah, you went to the wrong place. You people not used to travelling are always too eager. You have to shop around... 
should have come to me. I never take no for an answer. Bristol, give order number DB482 to Hewitt to sort out. He might be able to get it moving. Yeah, but I thought... Give it to <laughs> Hewitt. We're losing enough money on this. It's all yours and the best of luck. Well, thank you. And there's a penalty clause involved. You won't be able to do anything with it, but let's see. Let's get on with the real business of the day. What's the name of the travel agents? Travel agents? Mm. Uh, oh, Lord, uh, travel agents. It's um, oh, one of those complicated names that's difficult to remember. It was something like Ogilvy and Murr... Uh, no, Walter Donaldson. It was something like that. I can't remember the... Uh, they are clever, these travel agents. I swear they deliberately pick names that the punters find difficult to remember. In case there's a comeback. Ogilvy and Muir Walter Donaldson, you said. And I'm always find the first thing you say is nearest. But you've got the address. Address? The address of the travel agent. You've got that, of course. Uh, I went to so many, and they all looked the same, everywhere the same. It was all so confusing. That's why I can't remember. And I know how you feel. Sit down. Take it easy. It'll come back. What the devil is going on out here? Didn't I just give you a job, Hewitt? Yes, sir. Get on with it, then! M Mr. Bristow, I must get on. It, it wasn't a bucket shop, was it? Bucket shop? Fly-by-night organisations, that lot. Spring up one day, and they are gone the next. That's right. It was one of those, a bucket shop. A dark little room in the back of a house in a back alley, and there were some suitcases in the hall. <laughs> That's a bucket shop, all right. Wasn't fun, boys. No, no, not fun boys in the high street. It, it was seedier than that. Seedier than fun boys? Holy mackerel. <sighs> yeah, it's not a problem. You've got the documents, tickets? Uh, no, 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 they're, they're, they're in the post. Oh, so they say. It's a typical con trick by an unscrupulous travel agency. They saw you coming, I'm afraid. You won't see any tickets. Yeah, that's true, but it's only money, uh... Best to forget the whole thing and put it down to experience. That's exactly what they want. They bank on that happening. They get rich on people like you, but this time they have come unstuck. They have? Oh, of course they have. You've got me. When I say you've got me, I mean you've got me and the whole of the Chester Perry organisation. Mr Pristow. Stay where you are. I can see this has taken you by surprise. <laughs> We Bristows, as you have probably realised, are blessed with a fiery determination to see things through. So, in family tradition, I promised myself that I would assist young Hewitt to the best of my ability. My chance to get the show on the road came when Miss Peach brought in a batch of letters for him. Good morning, Mr Hewitt. Good morning, Mr Bristow. Here are those letters, Mr Hewitt. No time for letters today, Miss Peach. We have far more important things to do. Uh, not really. I'll take those. Leave them be, Hewitt. Plenty of time to deal with letters. I'm sorry, Miss Peach. Mr Hewitt has a holiday problem on his hands. Foreign travel. Holiday problem? Perhaps my brother can help. He runs a travel agency. Excellent. You see, Hewitt, the ball is starting to roll. Mr Bristow, I really... May I have your brother's telephone number? It's in my handbag. I'll go and get it. Shan't be a minute. I don't think... The show is on the road, Hewitt. <laughs> ah! The window cleaners. Just the people we need. Mr Bristow, I don't the see... Street what... credibility. That's the secret. Fighting fire with fire. Your window cleaner is well versed in the ways of the high street. Who knows? He may well have cleaned the very windows of the unscrupulous travel agents we seek. Good morning, gentlemen. Gentlemen, that's very kind of you, sir. Did you hear that, Godfrey? The gentleman called us gentlemen. I heard him, Dad. Say thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I wonder if you can help. Oh, if it's about the smear in the bottom left-hand corner, we can't do nothing about that. It's the birds. Ravens. It's the ravens, Dad. Uh, you heard that, sir. Uh, Godfrey said it's the ravens. From the Tower of London. Uh, from the Tower of London. Quite so. We are wasting time. We are in a hurry to find a travel agency. We have to dip this thing in the bud. Describe the shop, Hewitt. A few details on that might help. Start with the colour. Uh, it's sort of pinky, greenish, grey. Uh, I think I know the place. Off Brick Lane. They're all that colour around there. All painted to confuse. I'm sorry to be so vague. The whole thing is vagueish. Vague or vagueish? There is a difference. Yeah, good point. Tell you what. 
I'll put the word out on the street. What on earth is going on out here? You are getting on with that order. It's in hand, sir. Then why are you wasting time talking to the window cleaners? Close that window and be about your business. All of you! Good morning, Mrs. Purdy. Any specials today? Fairy cakes. What's special about fairy cakes? Four exciting new flavours. Cheese and onion, smoky bacon, barbecued chicken and salt and vinegar. Thank Mrs. You. Purdy, your brother's in the travel business, I believe. That's right. Any chance of his phone number, Mrs. Purdy? Yes, it's decaf tea number three, Cowan gate number eight, currant bun number one, chocolate bits. Uh, number six. Chocolate Bix, Chocolate Bix, Chocolate Bix. Three eight one six 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 six. I better write that down. Uh, give me one of those chocolate fingers. Right. Are you still here, Hewitt? Didn't I ask you to chase that order? Yes, sir. You haven't moved since I told you to get on with it. What the devil are you playing at sitting there drinking tea? When I tell you to do something, I want you to do it. Get on with it. I shan't tell you again. Made me jump, coming in like that. He ought to knock on the door before he comes out. Where were we? Mr. Bristow, you heard what he said. Look, I've got... If you were desperate for something to do, take this note. Down the works. Note? I've asked them to put half a dozen of their biggest men on standby, in case these trouble people get unpleasant and we need backup. Yeah, but... Off you... you go, lad. Bristow, I am watching you with undisguised fascination. As well you should, Jones. These modern kids haven't a clue. They think they know it all, but when it comes down to it, they haven't a clue. They have to. We have the benefit of age, experience and tenacity. Hewitt was quite prepared to give in because basically he is weak and yes. spineless. Mm. As are so many of today's youth. Youth. <laughs> but I have personally found that you have to hang on in to get anywhere. I hope you'll follow my example and become a richer human being as a consequence. There's no doubt about it. He'll learn something from this, all right. I'm off to see the firm's barrack room lawyer to sort out the legal position. Where's Bristow? I think he's helping Mr. Hewitt with that order. It takes two of them, does it? And why is that window closed? Don't you people believe in fresh air? Oh, no wonder you're half asleep the whole time. That's better. Get some air circulating, wake you up a bit. But don't just sit there gaping. Get on with your work. Mr. Jones. Hewitt, come in. No, I won't come in. I want to keep out of Bristow's way. I've got to get to grips with order number 482, but Bristow won't let me. He's driving me round the bend. I shouldn't hang around here, then. He'll be back any minute. I know. I just need a place to hide until I can sort this order. Hewitt! Here he comes. You haven't seen me. Have you seen Hewitt? He popped his head round the door a few minutes ago, but you've got him worried. In fact, I think he's in a state. That's the trouble with the youth of today. They take everything so seriously. <laughs> Holy mackerel! The window! It's open! Hewitt! Hewitt! Oh. Oh. I thought for a second. Have you tried the cloakroom? Good idea! Mr. B. What's mine? Have you seen Hewitt? Yes, a few seconds ago. He was sneaking up the back stairs. Great Scott, the roof! Call the police! And the fire brigade! Hurry! I'll try and talk him down! <laughs> Don't do anything stupid. It's only a holiday. It's not worth it. Just leave me alone. I've had enough. I'm sick of you. I'm sick of everything. Just leave me alone. Let me get on with it. Don't look down. Whatever you do, don't look down. I'm coming out, lad. Keep away from me. Hewitt, are you still there? Talk to me, Hewitt. Oh, shut up. It's all right, boy. Keep still. 
I'm coming over for you. Just relax. Keep away from me. Leave me alone. It's all right. Easy. Got it. Got you. You're in safe hands now. Relax, lad. I've got you. It's all right, everybody. I've got him. It's all over. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> You found Hewitt, then? Yes, he's a strange boy. He is. Too <coughs> dramatic. I'm still trying to help him out, though. <clears throat> Tell you the truth, I don't know why I'm bothering. I don't suppose I'll get a word of thanks. You won't. He started off on the wrong foot by choosing the wrong travel agency, and it's been downhill from there. But I've got all my contacts working on it, so something has got to be done. Oh, Lord, more drama. Coming, sir. Ah, oh, Hewitt. Don't ask. I, um... Just don't, that's all. Sorry. Why is he doing this? I've just had the papers on to me. I've had the tea lady's brother-in-law on the phone. Hickford from the firm's house journal has been pestering me for an article on the holiday scam. And I've been grilled by the medical officer for the past two hours. What else can Bristow do? I haven't done a stroke of work on DB482. For the first time, I've got a chance to show what I'm made of, and I end up talking to a shrink. I told you, didn't I? Didn't I say, don't rock the boat, didn't I? Watch, he's coming out. Ah, good, you're back. Time we pressed on. We've only got another four or five people to visit. I never in my wildest dreams thought it would be this difficult getting you out of a booking. These travel agents are a crafty bunch, but I don't intend to let them get the better of me. They've bitten off more than they can chew if they Bristow, think... stop. Mm -hmm. Please, stop. I'm putting you to all this trouble. No trouble at all. Ah, let's just see who's next. No, no, you must stop helping me, please. I've decided to take the last two weeks in May. Nonsense, we've only just started. No, I've had enough. I've decided to take the last fortnight in May. Please, Bristow. Please. But, but I, I, I insist. It goes with my desk. Yes, of course. Tell you what, I'll give you a hand with order number DB482. No, no, no. No. I can handle it on my own. Honestly. Two heads are better than one. No. All right. Okay. Now, I know that you're going to have your work cut out. I'll organise your holiday no, for you. No, no, please. No. Sorry, it's night flight. Just means hanging round at the airport till daybreak. But you'll be on holiday, and it's only for a few hours. You're going to love the place. It's got everything you want. I've never been there myself, but I'm sure you'll tell me all about it when you get back. It'll give you a chance to see the real Spain. <laughs> It'll do you good to get away. You've been overdoing it. Try to forget the office for a while. I've asked them to take special care of you as it's your first flight. And I've taken care of your insurance. <laughs> Death, maiming, kidnapping, act of God, that sort of thing. <laughs> Your watch is set to local time. Only thing left is to say, have a really nice holiday. Just hand luggage? Yes. Yeah, but no, there's this oh, suitcase. Oh, suitcase? It's order number DB482. You can read it on the beach. Excess weight, I'm afraid. That'll be £179.50, please. A hundred and seventy-nine pounds and fifty p. Take it. Oh, oh, you're in luck. You've got company. 
have a nice day. If I can help somebody as I pass along. Oh, morning, postboy. Anything for me? Postcard for you and Mr. Jones. Oh, it's from Hewitt. <laughs> Quote, weather awful. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hotel lousy. <laughs> Worst holiday ever, thanks to you. <laughs> uh, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves <laughs> laughing like that. Just as well Mr. Hewitt isn't a fly on the wall. <laughs> Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, Dora Bryan as Mrs Purdy, John Glover as Fudge and Sol Funboys, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy and Katie Odie as the Check-In Girl. Music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. The sound recording was by Graham Harper, the director, Neil Cargill. Well, next week, Bristow has an encounter with a stranger on a train who seems to be interested in a vacancy at Chester Perry's, just as one of his colleagues is planning his great escape from the office. Desert Island Discs Revisited on BBC Radio 4 Extra. This week, our castaway is the actor, humorist, artist, cartoonist and broadcaster... William Rushton. William, what are your feelings about uh, a desert island? I mean, it suits some people better than others. How could you envisage the idea? I'm I'm frankly terrified. I mean, the thing that really worries me is how I got there. The other thing, of course, you you never tell us is what size this thing is. Is it quite a reasonable but deserted desert island? But is there vegetation, rock faces, perhaps? Oh, yes, yes. rock faces, vegetation. You can pick your own island, providing it's not too big. How about music? Does that mean a lot to you? It's a strange thing in my life, music. I have no real musical taste whatsoever. I think basically I like listening to the radio and being surprised. I mean, what I enjoy most, I think, is driving down the motorway and just fiddling with this... I have this one little button you can press at the least dangerous moments when there aren't juggernauts racing on either side of you and see what comes up. And then I'm quite happy with it. It can be a bit of Mozart or it can be a showstopper or some meaningless pop number. Have Um, you any executant skill? Do you play an instrument? Do you sing? I sing, I think, almost better than anybody else on earth, but there are disagreements with this, but I have rather a good bathroom baritone and an amazing repertoire. Did it take you a long time to choose just the eight discs that you were going to take for this indeterminate period? I was a bit worried about what eight it would be. It was clearly a moment of panic. So what I did was I wandered around for about a day and anything that I started humming was obviously something or sang in a bath. I wrote down immediately. So this Mm -hmm. is a purely gratuitous eight. William, where were you born? Chelsea. In Uh, London. Privately, yes. Yes. In fact, the, the family had a my mother and father, I was an only. They, they lived in an upper maisonette in Phil Beach Gardens, which is off the Warwick Road, and I was caught and they had a cage erected out of the back in which the child rushed and was sunned and aired. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, it had to be moved because they started building the Earl's Court Pavilion and the brick dust began to settle on my infant face. <laughs> but you, you were, in fact, born with ink in your veins. Your, your, your father was in the publishing business. He, he was a publisher. Then you were educated at Shrewsbury, where you edited the school magazine. Was this the official magazine or some jelly press job that was private enterprise? No, this was, a, before we got at it, it was a very proper magazine, purely sort of sports reports and um, reports of the debating society and the literary societies and visits by field marshals and that sort of thing. Were you drawing at that time? Yes, more. I, I've always drawn more than I've written. 
So um, you put your own drawings in the magazine? Oh, absolutely. No point in being editor if you don't. Yes. I wasn't very good. I mean, I wasn't bad, but I, I definitely committed myself then to um, black and white and caricature, and I still call myself a cartoonist this day, never an artist. I'm a cartoonist, and it's a proud label to mm-hmm. wear. So one way and another, that was a pretty distinguished school magazine about a very small cog in a gigantic corporate wheel. This week, Bristow helps a colleague to plan his escape from the company. Bristow by Frank Dickens with Michael Williams as Bristow and Rodney Bewes as Jones. Stranger on a Train. Hidden Depths. Everybody has them. Hidden depths and hidden talent. Something they can do and they don't tell anyone. You might think you know someone for years and then all of a sudden they do something and wow, you never knew they could do that. They never mention it, but comes a moment and wow, you never told me you could play the piano like that. You never asked. That's what they say. You never asked. The point is, where do they get the time to practice? They're with you all the time and yet comes the moment and wow. Take Jones, for example. I work in the same office. My desk is next to his, and I genuinely thought I knew all about him. Until last Wednesday. What the devil is going on, Station Master? Where is the 815 commuter special? I don't know, and I don't care. Hmm? I set my promotional exam last week. This morning I was informed I had failed. <laughs> I'm thinking of ending it all, throwing myself under a train. Train? That chance of any train on this station. Oh, uh, excuse me, Hmm? do you work at the Chester Perry Company? Of course I do. Can't you tell by the pallor of the cheeks, the haunted expression, the frayed cuffs, the threadbare elbows and the shiny seat? Oh, uh, I'm applying for a a job interview with them. You'd like to work for Chester Perry? Good Lord, must be pretty grim where you are now. Where I am now is not so bad, but they, they keep advertising for new people. It makes those of us working there feel insecure, so... It's not a very happy atmosphere. You trade in a not very happy atmosphere for an atmosphere redolent of a South American religious cult group preparing to commit ritual suicide on the morrow. (laughs) Funny, they don't look like a head case. Although from the side, there's a hint of Simpleton. Uh, I should watch what you're saying if I were you. I don't like people calling me names. You're wasting your time trying to get a job with us. You're hothead. If you take offence at a little thing like that, you wouldn't last five minutes. You wouldn't even make it through tea break. And that's happy hour, when everyone's in a good mood. Do they pay you to go round upsetting people? They haven't got round to paying anyone anything yet. But it's early days. Well, it's been nice meeting you, so I'll say goodbye and good luck. But we don't get into the station for another ten minutes. I know, but I always try and jump off the train at this point. There it is, the Chester Perry Building. A great ocean liner ploughing its way through the waves of industry. There's my office, just below the Plimsoll line. Morning, Jones. You're cutting it fine. Oh, I was caught up in a strip search. Thought they'd stop doing that. No, a box of paper clips disappeared yesterday. Where were you at 4.15 yesterday afternoon? Climbing over the back days. I wanted to get home early. Oh, Bristow, do you ever get the feeling that life is passing us by, that things are beginning to happen in the outside world and we are no longer a part of it? We're stuck in a time warp, a stuffy office with no future, no hope, no prospects. Do you ever get that feeling? Of course I do. Goes with a job, doesn't it? Well, I've decided to do something about it. Look at the daily things this morning. 
Miles and Rudge, the firm across the street, are advertising for staff, and I'm going to apply for a job there. What do you think? It certainly has its advantages. To start with, you won't have so far to come in the mornings. I'd say an extra 20 seconds in bed. Not only that, they seem a much nicer crowd. Nicer than this bunch here, anyhow. Oh, I wouldn't say that. We've got the nicest lot of villains and vagabonds for miles around. Ask the local crime watch people. Oh, you wouldn't understand. I'm talking prospects. There's no future working here. I'm going to try and get an interview. Then don't come to work looking smart. Security have got sniffer dogs trained to spot these things. How much do you think I should ask for? Well, there's no point in asking for the same money as you get here. Ask for half as much again. So they laugh you out of the building. At least you are looking ahead. Your prospects here, with me in the way, are practically non-existent. And any goodwill you built up when you first started is long since evaporated. Morning, gentlemen. Why, look oh. here, Jones, a temporary tea lady. Come in, my dear, and show us your wares. If you don't like it, you know what you can do. Mrs Purdy said I was to take no nonsense from this department. Ah, Mrs Purdy's a fine tea lady. Salt of the earth. Or should I say, sugar of the tea. <laughs> she never quite got over the great tea trolley disaster, you know. Tea trolley disaster? What's that? Oh, we never discuss it. Out of respect for those who went missing and were never seen again. Of course, that was a long time ago. A lot of water has flowed under the bridge since then. <sighs> I'll say... Judging by the taste of this, most of it by this teapot. I don't have to put up with this. I didn't put up with it at Miles and Rudge last week, and I won't put up with it now. Ah, ah, Ma- Miles yeah, and calm, Rudge, calm, ah. calm down, calm down. Then just spleen on a rock cake. Are you saying you worked at Miles and Rudge across the street last week? Two days I worked there, and a harder working bunch you've never saw. Worked hard, played hard. That's the Miles and Rudge crowd. Take no Jones, hard working. A word seldom heard in this neck of the woods. Yeah, why then, my sugar lump, did you leave? <sighs> the supervisor over there don't like temps. Oh, that was a good job. No, he was crying over spilt milk. You are here now and stuck with us until Mrs. Purdy returns. And when is that to be? Two weeks. Two weeks before we get a decent cup of tea. Ah, oh, death, where is thy sting? Hmm. So you don't think I'll fit in with hard-working types? Of course you won't. Not the Miles and Rudge lot. Work hard, play hard. They are the idiots that played rugby in the park. Not that crowd of yobbos that spoil everyone's lunchtime kicking that stupid ball around. Mm. I don't believe you. I'm going to give them a discreet call. <sighs> Time I got down to a spot of work. Oh, let's see now. <clears throat> Letter from Holland and Babcock. Dear Mr Bristow, we refer you to your letter of the 15th, in which you threaten us with court action and imprisonment. This comes as a complete surprise to us, as, to the best of our knowledge, we have never had any dealings with your firm whatsoever. I see. <clears throat> letter to Mrs Holland and Babcock. Sorry about that. You must have gone on my mailing list by mistake. Morning, Mr. Bristow. Uh, morning, postboy. <laughs> What's so funny? You have the look of a man that's always on the run. I say we are trendy today, aren't we? What are you talking about? Your flared trousers. Don't be so idiotic. They're not flared. I was in such a hurry this morning, I put my shoes on first. I hope there's no mail for me today. I'm suffering from concentration fatigue. No, no mail. Uh, Mr. Bristow. Mm. When I came into Mr. Fudge's office last night to pick up the post, I saw him give you a dressing down. I've never heard anything like it. Wave after wave of invective delivered at the top of his voice and you didn't bat an eyelid. You stood there with your eyes lowered and your fists tightly clenched, totally oblivious to anything he might have said. How did you do it? Easy. I got the idea from a man I once saw operating a pneumatic drill. Don't you find it embarrassing to be in the office and see that kind of thing? No. It's terribly exciting. A spectacle of living colour. Fudge's face turning from red to crimson and yours going to white a shade of pale. Oh, boy! Oh. Shouldn't you be getting on with your deliveries instead of wasting time talking with my staff? I'm getting on with my delivery, sir. That's a good. You are not paid to waste other people's time, Bristol. Get on with your work! <sighs> OK, let's get down to it. Letter two. Uh, good morning, Miss Sullivan. Morning, Mr Bristow. Here is another chapter of your book. Uh, 
Thank you, Miss Sunman. It is not generally known in this neck of the woods that Miss Sunman is typing out a novel I am writing. I have a hidden talent for this kind of thing and hope to astonish my friends when the book is published. It is called Living Death in the Buying Department and is an expose of big business. The trouble with Miss Sunman is that she has a tendency to change sections to suit herself. My section on up-to-date technology reads like a sales catalogue. But apart from that, and a tendency to drop in an occasional torrid love scene, she is doing it for free and on the firm's paper in the firm's time, and the author has to accept this as part of the struggle. Um, you've only done the one chapter, then? I've been frightfully busy. I'm not only doing living death in the buying department for you, I'm doing living death in goods in wood for Mr Frost, living death in the accounts for Mr Horton, living death in production control for Mr Cornelli... Yeah, well, haven't these people got anything better to do? Yeah, uh, while you're here, take this letter. Thank you. How many copies? Uh, what? I said, how many copies do you want? Uh, uh yeah. Uh, what? Uh, Mr Bristow, are you listening to uh, me? No, not really. I'm watching the antics of that mouse over there in the corner. <laughs> You can come down off the desk. It's gone. Now, what were you saying? Oh, uh, Bristow, I've got that... I-N-T-E-R-V-I-E-W. Well done. What's he so excited about? Uh, nothing. How's your spelling? Pretty good. Better than most of them in the typing pool. <laughs> Congratulations, Jones. So, you've got an I-N-T-E-R-V-I-E-W. Well done. Uh, the only trouble is it's for this afternoon. I need a good excuse to get away for an hour. Easy. We lunch in the firm's canteen and you go down with food poisoning. Oh, we've done that one to death. We've done exhaustion through overwork. We've done bereavement in the family. Toothache, sunstroke, losing our way, housemaid's knee. We need something new. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's go for lunch in the park. We'll work on it. See you later. You're on. <laughs> Oh, I love coming to the park at this time of year. The colours are so vibrant in the bright sunshine. I'll say. The blue of that chap's suit, the red of his tie, the yellow of his socks. Well, the choice is yours, Jones. Where should we eat? Why not here, under the weeping willows? You mean Chester Perry Corner? <laughs> Why not? Rumour has it Shelley thought up some of his best lines here. The poet Shelley? Uh, no, Dave Shelley, the postboy who was sacked for scribbling graffiti all over the place. <sighs> Sir Reginald, oh. our beloved firm's founder paid for this bench out of his own pocket, you know. The inscription carved on the back by one of his hatchet men is his too. Please rest, O oh weary traveller, when tired limbs do throb. I'll make sure that you're back by two or find another job. <laughs> Pure Sir Reginald. Okay. You know, Bristow, this interview is quite important to me. If I landed the job, it could be a turning point. A chance, you might say, of a new life. Do you agree? Mm, what's that? I was talking about the chance of a new life. A new life. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Right. Whatever. It is that important. Uh, what's that, Jones? What's important? You haven't been listening. Oh, sort of, but I've been keeping one eye on that snake. Ah, yeah, get it away. Can't you come down off the bench, Jones. Oh. It's gone. Oh, are you sure? Yes. And people are staring. Oh, I hate snakes. <laughs> Bristow, regarding my interview this afternoon, I've decided to ask for twice what I get here. In my mind, I've already spent the original half as much again, and I'm still short. I'm not so sure about that, Jones. Don't forget other people will be after the job too. And if Miles and Rudge really are hard workers, you might have a job proving yourself worth that kind of money. Don't be daft. Look at that lot over there, behaving like yobbos. Fancy playing rugby in the park at lunchtime, with everyone taking a welcome break from work. <laughs> Especially that little fat one. Disgusting, I call it. They're letting the name of their firm, my future firm, down by such behaviour. Mind yourself, the ball's heading this way. Jones! Ah. Jones, leave it, ah. leave it! Watch ah. out! Hey, well taken. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. Obviously, you've played before. I've had my moments. I should give them their ball back. No way. Jones, I should give them their ball back. They don't like you holding on to it. 
They've no right to play rugby in the park. Let's have the ball, mate. Hey, give it to him, Jones. Give it to him. Let's have the ball, then. Can't you people read? There's a sign over there, no ball games. The ball, please, I'm asking you nicely. Give it to him, Jones. No. Well, what's going on? Give us the ball, chum. You want us to come and get it? <laughs> you can try. Up until that moment, things had been interesting. But all at once, an element of dodginess crept in. And that laugh of Jones added something unreal. It was the confident, mocking, taunting laugh of a scarlet pimpernel. Then came a moment of magic. As the man reached for the ball, Jones took off as if fired from a cannon. I have never in my life before seen such an explosion of sheer power. Nor did his speed slacken as, clutching the ball, he streaked across the park like a cheetah sighting its lunch, followed at a considerable distance by the host of angry Miles and Rudge men. There was no chance of his being caught, so great was his speed, and he had time to stop and wave the ball derisively before he entered the sanctuary of the Chester Perry building. I was both astonished and bewildered at this turn of events. How could a man with so much speed at his disposal ever be late for work, I was asking myself as I walked slowly back. <laughs> Jones, that was amazing. <laughs> Where did you learn to run like that? Oh, Were you brought up on the plains of Serengeti by a family of antelopes or something? <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> you were away and in full flight like Flojo. You could have been a world champion contender. <laughs> Agatha Christie, or whatever his name is, wouldn't have stood a chance against you. Seven league boots isn't in it. Oh, I've always been able to run. Got it from running away from authority, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, that's the word. Used to be a character in a comic like you, Wilson of the Wizard. Like you, not as fast as you. You are mind-boggling. Trouble is, we didn't get around to working out a good excuse for me, and uh, I've got the interview this afternoon over the road. I've got an excuse for you. You tell Fudge you've broken your spectacles and you didn't bring a spare pair. Tell him that without them you are as blind as a bat and can't do your work. And can you go home and get them? How's that? Oh, yes. Supposing he asked to see the glasses? That's the snag. You'll have to break them a little bit. Oh, I, I don't want to do that. Oh, 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 it's up to you. Is the chance of a new job worth the cost of repairing a pair of spectacles? Well, if you put it like that, it is worth it. How bad are your eyes? Are they good enough to get through an interview? Of course they are. Well, then. I, I can't bring myself to do it. You do it. Oh, give them to me. You're sure you want me to do this? Well, I... I was going to say no. Too late. You really smashed these. They'll cost a bomb. <laughs> a week's money at the new place. A bagatelle. And you can go in and wave these in front of Fudge without feeling guilty. Go in and see him now. You seem to be very helpful all of a sudden. I want you to get the job. I don't want to run against you on the Chester Perry Sports Day next year. <laughs> Here we go. And go. Ah, now for some work. <clears throat> uh, are you Mr Bristow? Uh, I am. And you are? Uh, Frost of Goods Inward. Uh, I'm writing a book and Miss Sunman tells me you are too. Uh, mine is called Living Death in Goods Inward. Uh, mine is Living Death in the Buying Department. Uh, am I mentioned in your book? Uh, yes. Am I mentioned in yours? Uh, you are mentioned in mine a number of times. Uh, there's a coincidence. You are mentioned in mine a number of times. Uh, you, you are, are on, on pages, pages 35, 47 and 96. Uh, uh -huh. The reason I'm here is because Miss Sunman gave me a chapter that doesn't belong to me. It's about a jewel robbery. Is it yours? No, but it sounds interesting, and I'll take it. Uh -huh. I'm bound to be able to fit it in somewhere. Thanks a lot. Uh -huh. This place doesn't change much. I haven't been in here for years. Uh, who's your boss? Uh, Fudge, isn't it? Uh -huh. <laughs> How is the old sourpuss? Uh, he's not the man he was, of course. There are signs his memory is beginning to fail him. Oh, dear. Not so much in the big things as you notice in the little things. For instance, he forgot to wipe the grin off his face before he came in this morning. Mm, nice one. Uh, mind if I put it in my book? I've already done it. Oh, never mind. Uh, uh, best of luck. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Ooh, and now for some serious work. It worked. Well done. Uh, what time is your interview? Like now. See you later. Wish me luck. You don't need it. 
And now to get down to some work. I don't believe it. Window cleaners, anything to stop me working. See that, Godfrey? That poor devil is called a white collar worker. A typical no hoper chained to a desk all day. Now, remember what I say, son. If you don't keep your chamois lever in good condition, you could end up like that. No, 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 Dad, no, no. <laughs> you and me both did. Look out. I'm going to open it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Good afternoon. Would you mind cleaning that bottom left-hand corner so that I can see my escape route? Uh, with pleasure, sir. <laughs> Say thank you to the man, Godfrey. Thank you. Uh, Godfrey, this is a white-collar worker. Uh, you don't mind if I call you that, sir? <laughs> I'm not exactly white-collar. My washing machine has been playing up a lot recently. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Godfrey seems very keen. He's soaping the bottom of my jacket. He's my son. He only started last week. Sally and George climbing up and down the ladder. I've told him... Every time he gets to the top, he's to pretend he's saving someone from a burning building. What the devil is going on? Bristol! Come away from that window and let that man get on with his work. Uh, yes, Mr. Fudge. Certainly, Mr. Fudge. Right away. Mr. Fudge. I want no more time wasted, you hear? Get onto Mercer's gun and frames and sort this order out. Stab me. Why me? Why can't he pick up the phone and do it himself? Just because he's chief buyer. Yes? Mary, get me gun and fames right away. If I give you a line, can you get it yourself? Why should I? That's what we pay you for. Oh, hoity-toity. Gun and fames, Kerwin speaking. It's about our order number DB564. Dear, you would have to ask for that one. Means going downstairs. Um, don't worry. Perhaps we can deal with JRT 9983. Would you believe that's downstairs too? <sighs> How about DLT 756? <laughs> you certainly pick them. You don't tell me that's downstairs as well. Yeah, they're all downstairs. I'm sunbathing up on the roof. <sighs> Mr Bristow, I've reached the end of my tether. Which one? The 9.30 tether, the mid-morning tether, the just-before-lunch tether, the 3.15 tether. No post to go down? What's the time? I'll soon tell you. Watch this. I reach for my hat, thus... Not yet, Bristol! It's only 20 past four! Does that answer your question? Thanks. Ta-ta. <sighs> Alone at last. It's been a long day. <sighs> Hey, I've just realised something. By leaning back in my chair, I can see the window box in the office across the street. And by covering my left eye and squinting through the fingers of my right hand, I can eliminate all the surrounding brickwork, and all I can see is a bunch of cool green leaves. Suddenly, I'm miles away in the heart of the countryside. Uh, Jones, are congratulations in order? Are they hell? Complete shambles. Hopeless. Waste of time. As soon as I walked in the room, I knew I was wasting my time. He just looked at me and I knew. Did you mention your years of experience? I didn't. For the simple reason I knew he wouldn't have been interested. And he didn't ask you? He didn't want to know. You told him you worked for Chester Perris. He already knew. I don't get it. He knew you worked here and he wasn't interested. And he was in personnel. His job was personnel selection. A man working in Miles and Rudge personnel selection, turning down people with experience from here. What does he want? He wants his ball back. Meet again. Hmm? You didn't get a chance to jump off the train this morning. Beg your pardon? It, oh, I remember. I didn't recognise you with all those bandages on your face. You're the gentleman that works for Miles and Rudge, who was going for an interview at our place. How did it go? It never happened. I never went. I wouldn't work for a firm like Chester Perry's if they were the last firm on earth. They're all morons. Hmm? I take my lunch in the park every day. I like to have a bit of peace and quiet over lunchtime. 
Of late, this peace and calm has been interrupted by a gang of yobbos who've taken to playing rugby of all games on the open stretch of grass near the willow trees, in spite of the notices forbidding the playing of ball games. I would have reported them had I been able to ascertain the firm they worked for. But today, I was approaching my regular bench when I saw one of them carrying a ball running towards me so quickly I had to do a sidestep, ah. a, a hidden talent I possess, uh, uh, to avoid being brought down. Mm. To my astonishment, he ran across to the Chester Perry building and disappeared inside. Oh, that was all I saw before those running after him knocked me to the ground and I sustained the injuries which you now perceive. They ought to be locked up. Animals like that. There's a law against that kind of thing. Law. Tomorrow my report will go in. Law. Eh. Laws, etc. Uh, I say, uh, are you all right? Mm, not really. I'm watching that spider that's dangling on a web just over your shoulder. Spider? Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Buse as Jones, John Glover as Fudge, Mr. Frost, the Station Master and the Stranger on the Train. Katie Odie as Miss Sunman, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy and Godfrey, and Sarah Huntley as the Tea Lady. The music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. Sound recording was by Graham Harper, the director, Neil Cargill. Next week, Bristow plots his own escape in the shape of a summer holiday. Desert Island Discs Revisited on BBC Radio 4 Extra. I need to tell our listeners, Sandy talks Vic, that during that piece of music, you took off your glasses, rubbed your eyes, almost put your head on the desk and said, am I being insufferable? <laughs> what are you worried I about? I don't know. It just seems, um, well, it seems very narcissistic for someone to talk all this time about yourself when there's so many more interesting things in the world. And anyway, that's... Uh... I've noticed your discomfort so far when I've asked you about being first in class or being clever or did you find that easy? You don't, you don't want to take on your own intellectual capacity in a public sense. Do you know what? It may be a very female thing uh, and, uh, and that is a worry. Um, so uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's very senior in news and he said to me, do you know, if I'm looking for an economics editor and I ring a woman journalist who's very capable, she'll say to me, I don't know if I know enough. I could ring the most junior man and he'll say, that'd be lovely, and he'll go out and buy a book on economics. And I think it is an issue. I do think that um, not many women put their hands up and go, actually, I'm, I am quite bright. And you won't find me doing it either. It was 1972 then when uh, Queen Margareta of Denmark acceded the throne and Sandy Toxig started boarding school in, mm. in, uh, in England. What do you remember of that, that year and those early weeks at boarding school? It was hideous, um, to be honest. Um, I uh, didn't know very much about British life and I didn't know anything about the shibboleths, the nuances of uh, the culture, even though I had uh, been here many times to visit my uh, grandparents. And you would have had an American accent? I had a very strong American accent and I remember <laughs> arriving at boarding school and Matron opened the door. And I said, hi, I'm Sandy. And she said, oh, hello, I'm Matron. I said, oh, what is that, like your first name, your last name? How's that work there? And uh, the girls, charming as girls can be, uh, because of my accent, immediately sent me to somewhere I'd never heard of, which is Coventry. Uh, and nobody spoke to me for the first six weeks that I was here. Bristow by Frank Dickens. 
with Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, and Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy. The Great Escape. Amadeus. Is it Amadeus? You know, the god of the sun. Or is it Leo? No, Leo is lion. Apollo, then. Hmm, sounds right. I think it could be Apollo. I should know this, being a sun worshipper. The sun is important to me. I watch it from nine until five every day. Not head on, of course, because of the damage to the eyes. I look to the side. From my desk, I watch it climb slowly, slowly, slowly. Oh, how slowly some days. Across the sky in silent majesty. A great golden face with a gold helmet and a gold beard, passing from left to right across the windows of the Chester Perry building. You can tell it's coming up to holiday time, the way I'm talking, and this year I'm organised. Not too organised, of course. I don't want to go through that again. A couple of years ago I went to Mudsea, and every day I booked for the mystery tour and the masked ball, and at the end of the holiday I didn't know where I'd been or who I'd been with. But that was then, and this is now. And this year, I've booked with Fun Boys, Halls for the Prowls Limited. So, you heard of our travel agency through a friend? Not a friend, no way. Chap that works next to me all day in the buying department of the Chester Perry organisation happened to be standing near a litter bin the other day and saw your brochure. Ah, the brochure, of course. Years of experience went into that little production. I was particularly taken with it, the way it's composed of letters cut from newspapers and stuck down, the way ransom notes are done. And to cut a long story short... Uh, don't tell me, sir, you hurried here. And No, I never listened to anything he says. I must have registered with my subconscious, however... Because I was in a telephone kiosk the next day, one of those kiosks that has a lot of those little cards stuck on the wall. Yeah, I can explain that, sir. Some of our distributing agents are not known to us personally. No, and... listen. Mm -hmm. And I was staring out of the windows of the kiosk, the way you do when you're waiting for the person at the other end to pick up the phone, and I saw this row of shops across the street. Of course, and you saw us. No, I am a sun worshipper and I spent a lot of my time watching the gold face with the helmet and beard crossing that little tent of blue that people call the sky. But I've always been careful of going blind, so I never look directly at it, always to the side. And as I was looking at the middle shop... You saw... The, the one, one on, on the end! end. <laughs> 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 so, here you are, finally, and you'd like a holiday? Hey, correction. I want to make all my own arrangements. I want a roof over my head and a telephone. You want a clerical suite? Then you shall have one. It must have a sea view. Fun boys to la plage is on the end of the pier. A firm flat bed. I'll get some pillows for the billiard table. All sweet bathroom. All the suites have a window. Hewitt, today I would like you to make as much noise as you can. Whistle, shout, sing, whatever you like. I'm on holiday next week, and I want to get used to sleeping on a crowded beach. Well, before you doze off, look at this filing system. What kind of system is it? I'm glad you asked, Hewitt, because it's my own system. The Bristow system. I before E, except after C, when there's an R in the month. I hope you haven't been doing it this way for very long. Ever since I've been here. And it's never been questioned. Hmm? You've never queried it yourself. It never crossed your mind of to... Of course not. Oh. According to my calculations, Mr Bristow, you've cost the firm umpteen thousands of pounds, possibly millions. Well, I never. That's all I can say. Well, I never. No doubt when they discover it, they'll stop it out of my wages. Wages? Dream on. Morning. Morning, Morning post boy. Mr Bristow... Is it my imagination, or does time really drag here? Work it out. I got in at nine, and it already feels like three score years and ten. Cheer up, lad. Oh, cheer up, he says. What for? What have I got to look forward to? What are the prospects for a kid like me mm, here? Prospects? Prospects? Yeah, a word you seldom hear in this neck of the woods. Bristow, you are on holiday next week. Uh, yes, Mr Fudge. Your work is up to date. Yes, Mr Fudge. Then stop wasting time talking with the boy. Get about your business, lad. And behave yourself! Yes, sir. 
I don't know how you let him speak to you like that. I wouldn't, as a rule, but as I'm going on holiday tomorrow, it's like water off a duck's back. Do you know what I'd do if he spoke to me like that? Mm. I'd get blind drunk, smash a few windows, loot a few shops, turn over a car or two and then have a punch-up with the law. You don't understand. That's exactly what he expects me to do. And then I get put into solitary and lose my holiday. No, thank you. I'll play it my way. Get a life. Morning. Morning, Jones. And a lovely morning it is. Oh, it's all right for some. Like those people going on holiday tomorrow. Oh, cheer up, Jones. What have I got to be cheerful about? I passed Fudge in the corridor this morning and I couldn't control myself. I gave him a look of malevolent hatred. Every fibre of my being was expressed in that glare. All the years of pent-up frustration showed on my face. My every feature was contorted with pure, unadulterated venom. Good Lord! What was his reaction? He didn't notice he was talking to someone. Tough. And he doesn't like it when you tell him to pay attention. <laughs> I'm wondering about bathing costumes. How do you feel about ankle length in leopard skin, or... Maybe something in... Oh, Bristow, I am not interested in you and your damn holiday. I don't care what you wear. Go away and let us get on with your work because that's the way it always ends up. Us doing what you keep putting aside as soon as you know you've got a holiday coming up. Isn't that the way it is? Sorry, Jones, I wasn't listening. I was reading my holiday itinerary. Oh! I began to realise that when you are about to go on holiday, everyone around you is slightly jealous. <laughs> well, not everyone. Mr Bristow, hmm? they say you're going on holiday tomorrow. It's not true, is it? Unfortunately for you, Miss Sunman, it is true. Will you be all right? Uh, bearing in mind the simple thought of it brings on dizzy spells, the occasional blackout spots before the eyes, hot and cold spells and trembling hands... I shudder to think of the effect that reality will have upon me. Are you packed? Considering the clothes I stand up in are the clothes I lie down in, there is very little packing to be done. So you may rest easy on that score. I wear my dinner jacket on the train. Here's my telephone number, in case you need me. Mm. Now, how can I contact you? A flaming torch set to a beacon on top of Muswell Hill would bring me hurrying to your side. Oh. Come and get it! Morning, Mrs. Purdy. And how are you this fine day? Oh, I'm in a bad mood since you are. Oh, do tell. I'm late because I refused to do an interview with the firm's house journal. They wanted to do an article on what it's like to be a tea lady, and I turned them down. I don't want anything in writing about me in case my friends outside got hold of it. They think I'm a private secretary. And, uh, Mrs. Purdy, since this is to be my last cup of tea before I go on holiday, I would like something special. Stand back. Well, drink it before it stops bubbling and the flavour disappears into the air. Mm -hmm. Going on holiday, are we? Where to? Mudsy. Oh, I've got a little sister lives in Mudsy. Francine, she runs a sandwich bar. Look her up and give her my regards, will you? Certainly. Now give me her address. Connie's Pantry on the front. You can't miss it on the front. I shall call there tomorrow. Morning, all. That was one of the most foolhardy acts I've ever seen. I shall report you to the... Have we met before? That prison pallor seems to ring a bell. I think we may have. I never forget a clenched fist. Oh, of course. That idiot buying cart from Chester Palace. You're not going to Mudsy. <laughs> Funny you should say that. As you can see by my Wallace and Gromit T-shirt, I am on holiday. Of course... The chap from the canteen good food guide. You're off to Mutsy too. Mind your own business and stay out of my way. The next stop is Mutsy. Please take your belongings with you when you leave the train. I wonder whether I've made a mistake coming to Mudsy for my holidays. I haven't been here since I was a child, and things are never the same. My word, how this place has changed. That's where the toy shop used to be. That's where the infant school used to be. That's where the sweet shop used to be. That's where the nursery used to be.
That's where the sea used to be. Here we are, fun boys, sur la plage. Yeah. Friendly reception area, a polished counter, and a map of the town. Yeah, let's see. Mm. Seems strangely familiar. Bank there, restaurant there, telephone there, secretarial college along the street. Holy mackerel! This town has exactly the same layout as the Chester Perry building. <coughs> 7.30, a shower, a change of clothes, and then yippee, the high spots. <coughs> Shop! Good evening. Uh, Bristow is the name. Show me the nightlife. Would you mind keeping your voice down, sir? Everyone has gone to bed. Oh, dear. And I was looking forward to getting something to eat. Your restaurant is still open. We'll open it specially. Can I take your order? Ah, I'd like an avocado with shrimps, poached turbot and a Chateaubriand bayonnaise with French fries and tomatoes. I'm sorry, and... sir. We don't do coach parties. <laughs> Typical English seaside scene. The sea, the cliffs, the cobbled streets. And on the sea wall, a grizzled old sea salt, spinning yarns to the youngsters. Let's tarry a while and listen. In my time, my young hearties, I've heard many a strange and terrible tale. But none worse than the hotnins on the hill faired schooner, the Westerbury Gilding. Westerbury Gilding? That sounds like Chester Perry Building. I'll get closer. Were splashing against the walls, and the cries of the crew were terrible to hear. Shiver my pins. It sounds as if he's talking about the great tea trolley disaster of 87. Of mercy, mercy came the cries, and only by the crew of the rescue ship. Sir Reginald. Sir Reginald? He is describing the great tea trolley disaster. Excuse me, sir. I don't wish to spoil your anecdote, only add to it. What? Oh, upon my soul, eh, children? That'll be the end of today's narrative from David's locker. Come back tomorrow for further stories. Move along now. Good day to all. Bye now. Who are you? My name is Bristow, and I work for the Chester Perry Company. Do you really? Which department? Buying. Oh, I used to run the publicity department. I was there for 12 years. Then one day I must have said something out of line, and, uh, well, here I am, and, and making a comfortable living out of the place. I, I talk about the luncheon voucher swindle and the coffee break fiddle and all the other day-to-day -day happenings when I work there. Uh, anything new I can use? Not really. Wait. A new girl started in a cunt yesterday. Perfect. Uh, parrots fighting over a captain princess as they are burying the treasure chest. Uh, Wonderful. What else? They've lined all the desks up in the typing pool. Ah, it's a, the King Chef's stirred information off the coast of Madagascar, waiting for the arrival of Captain Morgan and his band, the Cutthroats. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Tell you what, I'll buy you a drink tonight if you turn up at the Drake's Drum around seven. See you there. <laughs> Now then, Connie's Pantry, as recommended. Good morning. <laughs> Bonjour. Guten Tag. <laughs> Give up. What are you? <laughs> you mean nationality? I'm British. Are you Francine? Oh, how did you know that? You've been following me and listening, have you? <laughs> Tell the truth now. Your sister, Mrs Purdy, told me. She works for the Chester Perry Company. I know. <laughs> Do you want a cup of tea and a biscuit? Yes, please. Stand back. <laughs> There you are. Drink it before it stops bubbling and the flavour disappears into the ozone. <laughs> if your name is Francine, why is this establishment called Connie's Pantry? When Valerie, that's my sister, heard we was going to open a sandwich bar, she made us a present of cups and saucers and plates. Oh, of course. All the crockery is Mark C.P. Chester Perry, Connie's Pantry. <laughs> Very clever. And this biscuit tastes familiar. Hmm. The Bath Olivers don't travel. You won't tell anyone about the crockery? Of course not. Cross your heart and hope to die. You have my word. Is there any message I can give Mrs Purdy? No. 
And you better go. My husband will be here any second, and if he sees me talking to strange men, he gets violent. My life on the ocean wave. Ah, oh, far out on the briny. Just doing my own thing. What more can one ask of a holiday? Sea, sand, and sunlight. Looking to the side, naturally. Splash. Splash. <laughs> splash. Splash. It's so good to get away from the treadmill. Help me! Will pedalo number 27 come in, please? I'm coming in on the crest of the next wave. Whee! <laughs> Land ahoy. All ashore. Who's going ashore? Uh, that'll be uh, one hour and ten minutes at uh, four... Pound seventy per hour. That's um, hold, hold on. At uh, carry four. Uh, then there's a uh, bus seven. Uh, Just a minute. I know you. Mm-hmm. You used to work for the Chester Perry Company, didn't you? Run the accounts department. That's right. I ran it for seven years. Then one day I must have said something out of line. How are Chester Perry doing? They're going from strength to strength. No one seems to do any work, and yet we're getting bigger and bigger. I don't understand it. Strangely enough, I do. There used to be a man sat at a desk near the door of production control who used to carry the firm on his back. What a worker! Worked non-stop and flat out from the time he got in till the time he left. <laughs> Sounds as if he's still there. Chap with bags under his eyes. Mm. Yeah, he's still there. <laughs> hey! Anybody in charge of pedalos? I am. Well, how about some service? Just a minute, chum. Well, if you're too busy, there are plenty no, no, of no, no. other... Coming, coming. Sorry about this. Oh, no problem. Good heavens. It's Mr. Botherwick of the Canteen Good Food Guide. Ha! Ah, it's you again. <laughs> you were in Connie's pantry early on chatting up my wife. Uh, laughing and joking. Uh, what the hell is going on between you two? Uh, I want the truth, uh, even if I have to come and beat it out of you. Uh, now, steady on the get pair of you. Yeah, get out of my no, way. No, I've had enough of this chap. You lousy Lothario, you. Uh, Chat up my wife, would you? Uh, uh, I'll kill him. Uh, I'll kill him. That evening, I decided to see the local nightlife, so I called in at the Admiral Benbow to slate the what's-it and was suddenly aware of a man at my shoulder. Uh, May I? Oh, (laughs) please. First visit to Modsey? Yes. And I must confess I'm enjoying it hugely. The weather, the ambiance, in short, everything about the place. Mm, it's a funny thing, but I seem to know you, and I certainly recognise the voice. I work for the Chester Petty Company. Th- that's it! I knew I'd heard your voice before. I was fleet manager of the Chester Petty Transport Division for 15 years. Ah. And one day I must have said something out of line. Ah, oh, when I worked at Chester Petty's. I used to sit in the motor pool watching the sun climb slowly across the sky all day. Climb from left to right. You couldn't. Your window was opposite to mine. I get it from left to right. You must have got it from right to left. No, no, no. The the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, whichever way you look at it. Keep still. Let me come round to here. Uh, Oh, yes. You'd get it coming across from there to there, (laughs) yes. Hmm. (sighs) Did you ever see it as a great golden face? With gold helmet and gold beard. Uh, no, I, I, I always saw it as a gold Britannia without the shield and trident. But but I know what you mean. Mm. A golden face with a beard and helmet. <laughs> I like that. It, it's better than Britannia. <laughs> but you mustn't look at it full on. Always look at it from the side. Otherwise you can go blind. I've heard that. But I think it's here, sir. Uh, no, it's true. Believe me. You can. I've known people... Well, I don't want to talk about them... But they've all got guide dogs. (laughs) You must look at it from the side. Mm. What do you do? Now, I'm a local pilot. Ah. I've seen the big boats in and out of the harbour. It's a wonderful life. (laughs) No wonder you are so interested in the sun. It's an integral part of the job, I shouldn't wonder. It is. It is indeed. 
I'm sorry, but I have to go. There's a big boat coming in tomorrow. I need all the sleep I can get. Also, since I'm a local celebrity, after I've brought it in, I've been asked to switch on the town illuminations tomorrow night. Oh, sounds interesting. Well, around here it's considered a big deal, but to a townie like yourself, well, maybe we can meet after I've done that and uh, we can have a chat about old times. And I want it installed tomorrow morning latest. Who do these jokers think they are? When I want something, I get it. Close up, George. Sorry, chum, we're closing early today. Uh, just a minute, I'm in the middle of... Uh, Bristow? Hmm? Bristow? Of buying? Dougie Turner of accounts? Well, I never. What are you doing in this neck of the wood? I live here. Thanks to you, I own this place and a few hundred others. Mm? I'm rich, Bristow. And it's thanks to you. Thanks to me? Thanks to you getting me the sack from Chester Perry's. I don't understand. But you remember the business with the penalty clause over that invoice, and it was in your in tray all the time. Somebody had to take the rap, and it turned out to be me. Well, I never. I'm sorry. You don't need to be. The best thing that ever happened. Out of work and destitute, I turned my attention to the thing I loved above all things. Electronics. Come over here, look at this. It was an old-fashioned fruit machine. Something in my expression must have told him I didn't know what he was talking about, for he went on... This baby was the start of my fortune. Mm? Bloke I know was going to dump it because it didn't work, but something inside me said, Doug, don't let him... I got a book from the library and with some piano wire and some parts from an old vacuum cleaner, fixed it up and made it work. <laughs> from this baby, I built up the business to what it is today. And now I'm a rich man and I'm in demand. All the towns along the coast use my firm for everything electrical. <laughs> I see that you're looking at the machine and wondering whether it works. Mm. It does. And to prove it, I invite you to play. It takes old-fashioned pennies. Don't worry, I have an old-fashioned penny. It's OK, I have my lucky penny. It saved my father's life in the First World War, and I have it with me always. May I use it? Certainly. Off you go. Good score. Very good. <laughs> it's a great machine, huh? <laughs> Does the coin come back? Of course. Allow me. That's funny. These things are sometimes temperamental. <laughs> we'll soon have your dad's coin out. Where's my box of tricks? Now, we take this off here, and then... Pass me those pliers, it? And then we uh, remove... Ah, just a second, I'd better switch off the power. When these old machines are connected to a modern circuit, they sometimes need a period of time to readjust. Ah. Now, by pushing this, we get... Ah, there we are. One lucky penny. Thanks, Dougie. Listen, Bristow, I want to put this thing together and check things before I switch the power back on. I'll uh, see you around. Sure. Now then, where's that book on wiring? Leaving him to his tinkering, I walked slowly down to the town centre to watch the switching on of the illuminations. Everyone in Mudsey was there, but for some reason not known to me, there was an air of gloom. This was heightened when the mayor stepped forward and addressed the townspeople. Uh, as, as you know, Mr Ingers was due to switch on the illuminations tonight, but owing to the events of the day, of which the old town is fully aware, uh, yeah. <laughs> he is unable to be here. And I am standing in for him. Oh, okay. no, no, not having a speech ready, since I was called at short notice, <laughs> I will, without further ado, switch on the Mudsey Illuminations. <laughs> and then all at once, the lights came on. A blaze of living colour. Oh, and then, they suddenly went out again. 
The area was plunged into Stygian blackness. Voices around me voiced their sentiments. Is that me normal time around this part of town? Uh, someone's got some dodgy wiring around here. If we ever find out who it is, it'll be Lynch! <laughs> Sensing trouble, I dived into the nearby Admiral Benbow, which was not affected by the events I have just described, but was packed to the rafters. Everyone present was riveted by the television set in the corner, and following the adage, if you can't beat them, join them, I did just that. The accident of Muncie, which has caused damage running into millions of pounds, appears to have been the result of an error by the ship's pilot, who allowed the vessel to veer off course and hit the harbour wall. We go live to the stricken vessel and an interview with the pilot. It, it, it was one of those decisions that anyone in my position has to make once in a lifetime. The sun was low in the sky as we approached the entrance to the harbour. I've done this many, many times before, and there was no need for instruments. But I've been told as how the secret about looking at the sun is not to look at it full in the face, as it were, but a little to one side. Mm -hmm. told him that. Time to go home. Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Dora Bryan as Mrs Purdy, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman and Mrs Wood, John Glover as Fudge, Sol Funboy, the Station Master, Mr Engers and the Sea Salt, Christopher Benjamin as Bothwick and the Mayor, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy and Carol Starks as Francine and the TV Newsreader, with David Ryle as Turner. The music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. The sound recording was by Graham Harper, the director, Neil Cargill. Morning, Bristow. Morning, Trevor. How was the holiday? Wait till you see the photographs. <laughs>